All right, so hello everyone uh, and welcome to Improving availability, availability of Native Plants in New Brunswick. My name is Julie Cormie. I'm the Executive Director of Vision H2O. I will be your host for today. And but you may see you may see some of our partners that were responsible responsible for the um, presentation of this um, discussion today. I'll see. Um, donc avant de passer la présentation. Before passing the microphone to the first presenter, I'd like to recognize that we are on a. a non-ceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq. I invite you to add uh, your information on the territory that you are on so that we can know where everybody is. So you can do that on the chat function during the presentations. If ever you have questions, you can ask your question in the chat. Next slide, please. So we have a Big day for presenters. We're going to start with Gary Schneider, who will present us his experience with indigenous plants in the McPhail Woods, after which uh, there will be short periods of uh, Q&A. But if your question is not answered, we have a session, uh, a roundtable at the end of the workshop, and you will have a chance to listen to the question, to answer the questions there. David Smith will then speak to us on native plants, uh, tell us more about indigenous plants. Ben Whalen of the Kennebasis Watershed Restoration Committee and his experiences. And Claire Ferguson from the Invasive <coughs> Species Council of New Brunswick, who will speak to uh, us of her project, how to encourage indigenous plants and to reduce uh, invasive species that are causing many problems in our ecosystem after which we will have a round table we will have an opportunity to ask questions at that time and we will ask you to answer a questionnaire to react to the workshop now i would like to pass the microphone to the first presenter gary schneider the mcphail woods Gary Vazi. Great, thanks. Um, I just want to thank Serge and everyone else who's done so much work getting this together. Um, I have a lot of slides to show. We'll try to get through them, but I'm hoping that I can inspire you to get excited about native plants. So hopefully this all works. Look at that. Maybe not. How's that? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So we started um, McPhail Woods in 1991. It doesn't seem like 32 years ago. Um, and we're a project of the Environmental Coalition of Prince Edward Island. So we didn't set out to be a native plant nursery or, or really focus on anything like that. And I called this talk Changing Attitudes because that's really what our work has been. Um, we didn't set up and respond to public concerns. We set out to drive public concerns. And that continues to this day. So we were, uh, as you see in New Brunswick, this is what we saw all over Prince Edward Island and still do in a lot of cases. So bad forestry practices that limited the amount of diversity on those sites, that did a lot of soil damage from compaction or from uh, too much uh, excess sunlight on the sites, um, terrible wildlife habitat for most birds. So we're trying to move away from that. If anything was done on those clear cuts, it was plantations of things that probably shouldn't be there and shouldn't be there in those cases. 
So my interest originally was in birds, right? So if I'm looking at a red pine plantation, I'm thinking they're biological deserts. There's not really much going on there for wildlife. Uh, when you look at the forest floor, you see the lack of diversity in other plants. There's not much else shooting up because they don't have enough light. They're not really valuable. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what kind of role they play. But these are the types of things we wanted to change. And there are enough remnants of the Acadian forest, the Wabanaki forest, throughout Prince Edward Island. Um, to give me great hope that we could get some of that stuff back and that we didn't have to settle for bad, unhealthy, low value forests. The problem was when we set up the project, there was no way, I'm just gonna see if I can get these photos off me. Beautiful. Um, we wanted to do a bunch of different plantings, but we couldn't find sources for them. In a lot of cases, we couldn't even find seeds for them. Um, about 75% of PEI was cleared for agriculture at one time. And so we've lost most of our seed sources, except in small pockets. So generally, the forest types we were dealing with were very early successional. They were growing up on abandoned farmland. So white spruce, uh, black spruce, eastern larch, um, some balsam fir. Um, trembling aspen, white spruce, those kinds of species. And we wanted to go through the whole range of plants that would be suitable for those sites. So the fenced in area in the back was our first nursery done, I think it started in 92. And it was 40 feet by 40 feet. And I thought, you know, if we ever fill that nursery, that's going to be a dream come true. Uh, no one told me to stop there. So we just kept growing and growing and growing. But honestly, it wasn't in response to any consumer demands. It was in response to loving plants and wanting to know more about native plants and wanted to fit them back in so we can start rebuilding biodiversity uh, in our forests. So we never really thought about native plant landscaping. We were mostly thinking about reforestation and restoration of forests. Um, this is our nursery pretty close to today. A um, lot more damage from Fiona, but uh, we're about four acres with the Arboretum. And we grow uh, trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and ferns. Most of it is um, grown from seed. We do from some from cuttings, and we also buy some plugs from forestry on occasion when, when we're short of things. Um, we try to grow things in the sort of two to three foot range. That's easy to handle. It's a lot easier on your back. We do have some smaller plants, but we don't grow uh, plugs at all. And occasionally we start growing big stuff, which again is very hard on your back, but fortunately you can dig them up with a tractor. Uh, this is about a 18, 20 foot high sugar maple that we've been using in planting. They're just gorgeous plants. But Generally, we try not to get into that market. We have a shaded area for things that need a little bit more protection or looked after a little more closely. Some things we can stick in the field and we don't have to look at them, but other plants uh, we want to be really careful with, especially some of the rarer ones. And we tend to plant things very tightly and then transplant them. So these are transplanted blue bead lily, cornflower. And they'll be ready to move again in probably a year and a half or two, and then to plant out right away. Um, we never had a greenhouse for more than 30 years, but we got one um, through a gift from the province uh, about two years ago. So we're really just learning how to make best use of it. Uh, it's quite a large greenhouse, and there's a lot to learn. I've been involved with food greenhouses before, but this is a different beast. And we're very fortunate that it held up in Fiona. We use every bit of um, manure and compost that we can find. Again, it's a big nursery now. We luckily have a couple of horse owners uh, who will either bring us the manure or we'll pay, we'll pay for delivery. And that's been a godsend. You can imagine filling out a hundred or more beds 
um, we use a ton of compost and stuff. And when we say bare root plants, we don't wash the roots of soil. So we're actually selling our best soil every time we move a plant. So we've got to compensate for that. We're trying to make a lot more use of organic growing techniques. We've always been organic. We've never been certified, but we've never used uh, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers or, or insecticides. We're using a lot more buckwheat as a smother crop to keep down the weeds. So it means less hand weeding. I believe this is uh, winter wheat, it might be fall rye. Um, again, as a smother crop and to bring some organic matter back into that soil, which is critical for us. We're also using a lot of uh, different clovers, again, as a smother crop, to, but to rebuild some nitrogen uh, levels in that soil. And the nursery is in a smooth operation, I'll tell you. It's, uh, we also do a children's program. We do all kinds of management plans and forest restoration. We have 2,000 acres of public forest land that we manage, all kinds of courses and workshops. So sometimes the nursery gets neglected, but we try not to let it get neglected too much. So I don't want to paint a picture that everything's perfect in the nursery. We set up an arboretum about seven or eight years ago, really to display beautiful plants, because I can talk about nice plants and I can even show you nice slides but it's only when you see them in action, in person, with insects and birds and stuff around them that you can fully appreciate them. We tend to plant things in big blocks. They're really useful for uh, attracting pollinators. And we've even uh, put in a wetland area. Um, I've always wanted a pond, so this sort of gets me through that need. Um, but it's really fun to be growing things like pitcher plants, which again, always seem so exotic, but you can grow them and relatively easily. And we found a seed source for uh, bake apple, for cloudberry, they call it, uh, up on the, the northeast, northwest corner of PEI. And they're really a beautiful plant. And it's interesting because I read two or three papers on growing bake apple. And they kind of said, don't bother unless you're using some serious chemicals to break the, the uh, seed coat on them. And what we usually do is we just clean seed and plant it and don't worry about it. And we've been remarkably successful in, with both the cloudberry and, and many other species. We use all these areas for multiple purposes. So when we do tours, when we do workshops, when we do university classes, we use the nursery and the arboretum um, to teach ecology, to teach identification, to teach birds. Uh, so we're trying to get multiple results out of one action. And there's a tremendous interest. Again, when we started, it was really trying to get people to understand these plants and to think about using them in their forest. And then we started giving workshops on native plant landscaping. Uh, and people started wanting us to come out and do the landscaping. So that's become a big part of our work. And it's really nice because it funds a lot of our work that doesn't pay um, because we're going to landowners and, and carrying out work for them as any landscaper would. So this is one of the, just a simple landscape beds. A couple of, there's a red baneberry and a white form of a red baneberry and uh, hairy sweet sicily on the right and ostrich ferns and all kinds of things in there. This is a, a shaded bed that has four or five types of ferns and witch hazel and things that will grow well in those, those areas. We've done tons of, of new beds and beds out in the open, all using native plants. We've done a lot of woodland plantings are really interesting. So around people's house, or this is the old, part of the old arboretum at McPhail, the shaded arboretum. We've done plantings at maybe 20 schools. Uh, and again, the planting is one thing, getting the students involved is another thing, getting them working together is another thing, and getting them interested in native plants and starting to think about the birds that might come to those sites. So you get so many positive results from one action. And just a bit of a heads up, just because they're native plants, um, 
they can't go everywhere. So I remember somebody coming back kind of in a steam one year and saying, you know, the sugar maple I sold him didn't do very well. And I said, well, where did you plant it? He said, in my cottage up on the North Shore. So it's getting salt spray and full sun, and probably never got watered and stuff. So we always try to caution people to use the plant in the right place. So to learn about those plants, but these are red pine growing in a really windy location and they look awful and they should never have been planted there. So just again, we always caution people who are buying plants or coming to workshops that just because they're native doesn't mean you don't need to know anything about them and you can really beat them up. One of the favorite parts of my job is collecting seed. So if we're out for a walk, if we're birding, if we're doing research on whatever areas we're researching, um, we're always collecting seed. That's a really fun thing to do, especially of plants that you've never grown before. And I find seeds are really interesting. I like to look at them. I like to play with them. I feel like a kid again because I can run my hands through things. These are witch hazel seeds. Um, it's one of the plants that taught me that just because something is rare, doesn't make it difficult to grow. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I always associated rarity with difficulty, but it's not connected at all in many cases, not all, but many cases. So we've probably grown, I would say conservatively 10,000 witch hazel and they're seeding all over the place, which is really fun to see. Um, we probably changed the status of this uh, plant on PEI. There was only a few places you could find it, and now there's lots of places you can find it. Not enough probably, but lots. Every fall we're collecting acorns. My daughter and I collected acorns. She's 32 now. Uh, she was probably three when she, we started collecting acorns. Great activity for kids. These are yellow birch, uh, just starting to sprout. We generally put the birches on the surface of the soil. Um, they seem to do better with sunlight. You can get a ton of plants growing in a small area. And again, we try to keep them tight and then we'll transplant them out once they get true leaves on. Uh, same thing, this is a bed of swamp milkweed, really tightly grown and we'll, we'll transplant them out, space them out. These are seeds from nodding trillium. I think again, a lot of the seeds themselves or the seed casings or the fruit are quite beautiful. Like a lot of things, we just don't look at them well, but these are gorgeous. They're almost like pieces of art. These are seeds from blue flag iris. And we found these from um, a site in North Cape where we found the baked apple and squash bread. Um, the northeastern part of PEI, it's a perch bog. It's on a very high cliff, but it has all kinds of rare and interesting plants there. And I saw some blue flag iris and I collected the seed from it. And they were about six inches high and pretty ratty looking because of the conditions. And I thought, well, maybe I will do a planting like this somewhere and I'll need a plant that will take salt spray and, and lots of wind. So I brought them back to the nursery and I'll show you later on what they looked like when they came. We do all kinds of non-rare uh, plants, either choke cherry, they're a fantastic plant for wildlife. So they may not be a specimen plant for landscaping, but they're great in a windbreak or in an area where you're trying to get something growing, an old field planting. And that's usually the stage we'll transplant them at. When they have enough root to carry the top of the plant, Um, again, we collect hemlock, all kinds of comfort tree seeds, sugar maple. Besides the seeds, we will grow things from cuttings. So willow is, is next to impossible for us anyways to grow from seed, but it's so easy to grow from cuttings that we don't worry about that. So we'll take um, cuttings in usually in March and, and get the callus growing on the base of them, stick them in some compost or sawdust or whatever we have. And then as soon as they start forming roots, we'll plant them out. Uh, we do a lot of cuttings from uh, 
common elder. So it's the elderberry that you use in wines and pies, but also a fantastic plant for wildlife. So mostly stem cuttings, we'll just cut them in the fall, stick them in the ground and get quite good roots on them. We also do um, root cuttings from common elder and bayberries, another one that grows well from, from root cuttings, um, um, wild rose. We've also tried doing some um, aeration uh, with cuttings. And you get water underneath and you get air bubbling the water. It's supposed to be quite magical. And I think they use it a lot for growing dope. But for what we wanted, I didn't find much value in it. It was a lot of fussing. And we're not generally in that much of a hurry for 20 or 30 plants. You know, we often grow hundreds of plants at a time. So seeds really work well. So hemlock is one that we use a lot in landscaping, but also in forests. So again, we're all about trying to get these forests back into health. And as long as we have the right light conditions and enough ma organic matter in the soil, we can really do well introduce, reintroducing species such as um, hemlock. White ash, I know people are worried about diseases and insects. Um, hemlock woolly adelcha is definitely a thing. Um, the emerald ash borer is definitely a thing. I don't think we can give up on species. And we're not talking about planting, you know, a thousand trees per acre in a plantation. We're talking about putting these in as a mix. And if they don't do well, they don't do well. But there's something that wants to eat or infect every tree and every plant. I think, you know, we can't sort of worry and say, well, we're not growing butternut. We're not growing this. We're not growing American elm. You wind up having little to to choose from. And I think about the example of Norway maple, where about up to maybe five or mostly 10 years ago, people thought Norway maple was God's gift to trees because nothing seemed to infect it until tar spot infected it. And now everybody's trying to get rid of it. So it was, a, you know, we, we're trying to predict what will happen to species, and we really are very poor at that. This is striped maple. Um, again, because we're working with a lot of old fields that have grown up into forests, we don't have near as much of that as we should. It's a gorgeous tree. If you're landscaping or you're trying to restore your forest, the flowers in the spring are so gorgeous. And the bark, especially on the younger parts of the trees. So it's one we use to get that diversity within the stand. So diversity isn't just the amount of plants or the amount of wildlife but it's the structure of the forest soil. It's the heights of plants in different trees. So you have different layers, different canopies in your forest. And the reason that's important is that some birds like to feed on one area, but nest in another and perch in another area. So if you just have a red pine plantation where all your growth is on the top, it cuts out that area for a lot of species. Uh, ironwood's another tree, again, that's fantastic for reintroducing into forests. You have much more of this than we do on Prince Edward Island. Um, we're down to, to very few areas with ironwood, but it's a great landscape tree, and it's also a fantastic plant to put into woodlands. Um, this is, uh, I'm just looking at time. Um, this is uh, blank. Uh, witch hazel. It's a medicinal plant. It's another plant that'll give you sort of 15 feet of height in the forest, but it's as almost as perfect a landscape plant as you can think. So we used to grow it because it's rare, and now I grow it because it's beautiful. And I think we often will look at native plants as, you know, wild and tough and maybe hardy, but and the other plants that we know. Um, as beautiful. But uh, when I look at our nursery, our, our uh, landscape beds, and other people's landscape beds that's full of potentilla and wigilia and boxwood and things like that, I've got no problem talking about how beautiful our beds are and how beautiful those plants are. And part of that is how do we learn things? So I didn't have and still don't have any horticultural training, but I learned the plants that I love and kept finding new plants that I love and tried to move forward with that, learn how to grow them, learn how to use them, where do they fit into environments. 
where if you take um, a traditional horticultural training, they don't teach you a lot of these species. So it's really no wonder that we stick to ones that the nurseries provide and that the, the landscapers are asking for. These are beautiful berries on them. Great plant for birds. This is a hobble bush again. Great colors in the fall. That's just a super, super landscape plant. Um, we do a bunch of plantings for people and continuously do these for people who are really interested in getting birds to their property. So that was a pine grosbeak. They're a fruit eating bird in the winter. So we use things like wild rose is again, it's a lovely plant. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to bag them up or cut them off every year. We just let them grow. And they're, they're quite beautiful and they flower a long time. So they'll flower into September and give you some winter color. So these are all plants where the fruits will hang on most years. These are uh, American mountain ash, more reddish berries on them, smaller, keep them over the winter. A highbush cranberry, another plant that's fantastic for wildlife. Um, that's what it looks like in the winter. So it's just a lot of food hanging on. And the robins and many other species go crazy for them because you've got food on in the winter. This is one of the hawthorns. I think this is the fireberry hawthorn. I hadn't known how beautiful the flowers were until I took a close-up of them. I thought, man, that's, that's an exotic plant. So again, lots of food over the winter, not first choice food, um, but it's the thorns on those hawthorns, which are about two inches, maybe two and a half inches long. They're incredibly useful for birds. The small birds can hide in there. This is a plant that we're using all over the place. It's winterberry holly. It seems to grow in almost every environment. So landscaping is fantastic, but woods with a little bit of light into it, wet areas is great for that. Another one that produces winter food. I don't really like the plant until it starts forming berries and they turn orange. So in the fall, uh, the leaves will fall off and the berries will just stand out like crazy. And again, all kinds of birds and, and small mammals will eat those fruits. This is one we saw up towards Surrey and it's uh, Bohemian waxwings and pine grosbeaks. And it's like, wow, those are two incredibly beautiful birds because you have that food available. Uh, service berry is another one great for pollinators because it's so early. So Saskatoon, Indian pear, Indian plum, shad bush, all kinds of names. Uh, many of them have beautiful colors when they emerge. So they actually have fall like colors in the spring and then turn green. Uh, tons of fruit on them. I think the best tasting fruit that's grown, uh, certainly wild food that's grown um, in PEI. And we've forgotten how good they are. We've forgotten almost how to eat things. Red berry is a big rugged plant that's again, we grow for wildlife and not really much else. It's not really a specimen plant, but it produces a ton of food and always attracts birds. And it's uh, brother or sister, the common elder. Beautiful landscape plant, this one. And again, some of the most beautiful birds, these are cedar waxing. Uh, that you can find anywhere. Wild raisins, another plant that I get really excited about. We've had some you know, insect problems with it, but it's really a beautiful plant. Produces these really interesting seed clusters or fruit clusters that have different colors. And it's really attractive for lots of different types of birds, like purple finch. Um, I'm going to speed a little bit. Red osier dogwood. Um, a common plant, people forget how beautiful it is, but I go to other places and they're using it all the time as a landscape plant, which we've sort of reintroduced, gotten people used to using. And again, lots of birds we think of as seed eaters or suet eaters, fat eaters, um, change their habit when the eating habits when there's lots of food available. Um, things like we sell quite a few um, beaked hazelnut. 
with the native hazel that we have. They're edible to humans, but if you have hazelnuts around and you have trees, you're going to get flying squirrels. And that is one of the most beautiful mammals that you can find anywhere. And I mean anywhere. They're so gorgeous. They're a nocturnal mammal, uh, but they're beautiful. And we get to see them at night because they come to feeders. A few more rare plants. This is bog birch. It's about a six foot high birch. Um, and I always thought if something's called bog birch, it will only grow in bogs. But we grow it in our nursery and it seems to do just fine. It will tolerate those bog conditions. So those are the flowers in the spring. It's really pretty. Uh, large, uh, sorry, round leaf dogwood. So we have four native dogwoods, including bunchberry. Um, we do a lot of planting for people who uh, we're trying to get them, we're trying to encourage pollinators and they're interested in having more wildlife. So it's a good mix. So this is swamp milkweed. As soon as we started growing it in, in the nursery, the next year we had uh, monarch butterflies. The thing I like about this especially is that it gives people an opportunity to help um, with an endangered species by providing food and habitat. And people will call me up and they've come and bought plants, taken them home, done all the work, planted them, call me up and thank me again because now they have caterpillars on their milkweed as if I've done something special where we've just provided opportunities. We try to keep our nursery quite wild. So there are opportunities for things like this, for birds nests. We have wild spaces. Uh, and not just uh, butterflies, but these hummingbird moths are really so exotic. And that's again, when you have a mix of plants, you can get all kinds of interesting critters around. I'm getting my five minute notice without even seeing it. Um, this is cut leaf coneflower, big tall plant, beautiful in Rudbeckia family. Six or seven feet high, great plant for pollinators. But I didn't realize we have these big blocks of them in the arboretum. In the fall, we'll have 50 or 60, besides the grasshoppers, 50 or 60 American goldfinches come and spend maybe two weeks just cleaning out our beds of uh, cut leaf coneflower. Joe pie weeds are rugged plants. So some people don't like it, but I think it's gorgeous. And it's tough uh, and it's another great plant for pollinators as is bone set. Blue vervain, I think is a stunning plant. We only started growing it four or five years ago. I had never met it before. But it's a really pretty plant. And our beds of vervain are just packed with pollinators, uh, sort of, I'd say, in July area. This is the offspring of those seeds that I brought back from North Cape. These funky little six-inch plants turned into 14, 15-inch plants that are just the flowers on them are incredible, so complex and the colors blending together. And the other plant we use for pollinators are these small uh, blue-eyed grass. So they get overwhelmed easily, but in the right setting, they're really a nice addition. And again, small plant, we don't look at them very much. Um, a few more I'm gonna race you through. These are yellow violets. Again, if you're doing any kind of landscaping, they're fantastic. They will bloom from late May until September. Each one of these pods has about 70 seed in them, and they're fantastically easy to grow. In fact, in some cases, they're almost a pest, right? Because they throw their seed and they open, but that's a pest that you would love to have. These are uh, Jack in the Pulpit fruits. Again, really a piece of art, right? They're so beautiful. And we grow them from seed, and then we start growing them from the corms because they expand like bulbs. These are the um, blue, um, blue bead lily and cornflower corn lily, they call them. Again, a smallish flower. We don't look closely, but when you do, you're really rewarded with a, with a beautiful sight. This is our small uh, dogwood that we have. This is bunchberry. In the fall, it looks like somebody's decorated your woods. This is the, the painted trillium with the coloration in the center and the upright flower. And we just collect the fruit, clean them up, 
and then plant them. And they they take a while to grow, but they're not difficult for sure. These are nodding trilliums. The other trillium that we have that's native to PEI. And this is one of our nursery beds with them. Another really interesting flower. This is, uh, oh, two more. This is Dutchman's breeches. It's, I love the little flowers. It's a spring ephemeral, it comes up and then goes away. But the foliage is really delicate and beautiful on them. Canada anemone is another plant that's really easy to grow, almost too easy to grow. It does spread like crazy, but the white flowers on them are so brilliant. And I think I'll just do the, the vines. Um, this is our native clematis, virgin's bower. Really nice small white flowers in the spring, but I love the fall colors. I hadn't realized that they would be so colorful. And the last one I'm going to show you is uh, ground nut. So we found some seed on, on uh, Lennox Island. The flowers, again, are big and they're really strange looking, but quite beautiful. The uh, ground nut was brought over, I think, uh, to replace potatoes in the Irish potato famine. And we think they were brought to PEI from the Mi'kmaq, by the Mi'kmaq, but not much work has been done on them. They're hard to grow as a cultivated crop and they do produce some size. So it's something that we're gonna keep looking at. And I was gonna to talk to you about ferns. I oh, got one minute left. So this is a bronze holly fern, only found on two places on the island. And there's another one, male fern. We started growing things from spores. So that's a whole nother topic, but that's something that can be done. And I'm gonna make my time. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I think we have five minutes for stuff. So that's a ton of information. Sometimes I do afternoon workshops with those plants, um, but it's nice to have 30 minutes to get through. Thank you so much, Gary. Merci, Gary. C'était très intéressant. Beaucoup de beaucoup d'informations. Thank you, Gary. It was very interesting. A lot of information. I see there are a few questions in the chat. So I'll pass over the mic to Serge. Can you unmute yourself, Serge? Samuel was asking about using sedge lawns. That's something that you're familiar with, Gary. So using what? Sedge lawns. So maybe... Sedge lawn. I don't know anything about that. Sorry. It's getting popular in the States. All the sedges are sold out and like it's like right Okay. Corrects, like the correct species. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't do much on lawns. We do landscaping for people, but um, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, you can do it when it's work. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that in, Samir. Uh, there was a question in terms of schools and how have they been at maintaining gardens that are planted, especially sort of in the long run or in the long term? Um, I think they're fantastic. I think they're better than some landowners. Okay. And one thing I found is that we we do the placement. We everything's set up for them, but they dig the holes and they plant them and they haul the water and they mulch the plants. And we we talk about them. So it's not just a planting, but it's an educational experience. So the kids come to me and say, you know, is it okay if I come and water my plants in the summer? And I thought, well, that's <laughs> that's very cool, right? And they name them often. So not perfect, not everything. And we do get, still get um, um, maintenance people who will run them over. But most times with the schools, we're dealing with the principal or the vice principal, as well as a, as a, well as a teacher. So we make them pinky swear that they're going to talk to their landscape people and their, their maintenance people, and they won't be running over things, right? They're going to be careful. It's going to be a bit more work for them. But those students put a lot of effort into planting those trees. And over the years, that's going to have an incredible impact on that school. Nice. Building that stewardship, for sure. Yep. yep. Uh, Judy had a question about, do you prefer growing plants and trees from seeds or from cuttings? I love growing question. them from cuttings. Yeah, cuttings? I'm sorry. I love growing them from seed. I do cuttings as well, and it's fun. Um, to me, 
one of my big things is, is if I can collect that seed, I understand where it came from. And when I plant it, I know more about it. And when we're actually harvesting those plants and moving them to another place. And then when I see birds nesting in those trees or eating that fruit, and then when I see those plants seeding out, that's really the end goal, right? It's not mm -hmm. just um, putting a plant into place. That's a big deal, but not really that big a deal. But when I see an ash tree start to seed ash, or I see a red oak start to have young all over the place because of the seed, that's increased the footprint of the work that I've done tremendously, right? So when we talk about uh, restoring fields and stuff, we're not putting a thousand red oak per acre in. We might put six, and let all kinds of other things come up, but eventually those six red oak, we're gonna treat them nicely and they're gonna start seeding in, not only to that acre, but to four acres and acres and acres away as the squirrels and blue jays move them. The big looking at the bigger picture. Um, yeah. Maybe there was, a, there was a question here, but do you sell trees and your seeds to the public? Yeah. We do. We don't do many seeds, although we do. Uh, the wildflowers are a little bit easier to do them in bulk. And we're starting to work with the city of Charlottetown to figure out like a highway mix that we were for one of their parks that had a development beside it and, and a lot of things torn up. But they're looking at something that we can spray on, which I think is pretty creative of them. So we're going to work and see how that would be. Um, I tell you, lots of times we just give things away. I feel we've had so much help with things. So if somebody comes and says, I want to start a nursery, can you give me enough seed? I can't do that. But for landowners and especially people we've worked with a lot, you know, we're, we try to be not hoarders of information or material or anything like that, because I think everybody at McPhail feels really fortunate, right? We're, we're doing great work, I think. We've done it for a long time. Staff have been there for a long time, but it's pretty remarkable to get up in the morning and love your work. And I've been doing it, this particular job since 91, and I still love my work. So I can't be hoarding things, right? If somebody comes and says, I want to grow swamp milkweed and I need some seed, we'll help them for that, right? Because it's not really any harder to collect, you know, an extra five heads of, of swamp milkweed seed and stuff. So I, I think the answer is when we can, we try to be very friendly with that. That's awesome. Um, such amazing information. So great to hear it in your voice and with your passion and history and the amazing work you put putting through together. A lot of questions about some specific, exactly like you're saying, you're not hoarding any of this, uh, this information. So people are looking lots of questions on specifics. Now your website's a great source um, yeah. in terms of what you offer at the at the, the nursery, also in terms of your workshops that you offer. Um, so folks might want to look into that. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll paste the, uh, your website into the chat. People can have a look there. And we'll see about getting perhaps some of these questions in at the end of our session. At the end of the presentations, we'll have a bit of a, a panel, a like a panel discussion or a little more of a Q&A session. So we'll jot some of the questions that are in there now in the chat and we will get a chance to get to some of them anyway. Great, thanks. That was Richard. wonderful, Gary. Thanks, Alge. We're going to take a five minute break. Afterwards, we'll have David Smith's presentation. So we'll come back in five minutes. This is in Fredericton. So David will present his experience with uh, native plants uh, in his uh, backyard. So, David, uh, go ahead. Oh, yes, okay. Bonjour. Uh, hello, people. Um, I am honored to be here. It's all because of Julie. Um, I think it's gonna be a good show. We've just started. We're gonna learn a lot today. Um, just to, just to wanna say, um, to Gary, and I'm, I'm impressed with what he has done. Um, my little industry, I started in 96-97. Uh, it's called Save a Native Plant. Now, I was just starting high school in 75, and I heard uh, Jack Fennety talk about us failing on our New Brunswick report card. Now, going through the school system, I knew what a report card was, but I didn't know what native was. 
And uh, I, 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 I deal with the understory plants. I'm not there with the, with the trees. I just don't have the room. It's just a little backyard nursery. I deal with the, as, as I stated, the understory plants. I deal with the relics. I worked with a few rarer plants. So I'm just doing basically what they're called perennials. Um, so there was a question on uh, schools. Uh, somebody had asked, uh, I had a uh, wonderful opportunity to work with the indigenous First Nation people at the, med we, we designed a, med a medicine wheel on the UNB campus. Um, I just supplied the plants to the children and I just stood back and watched them go at it. So we both learned that day about what plants are used for. Now I find with a lot of the indigenous native people, they seem to be losing a little bit of their history, which is quite sad to me. Um, there was another school that I was involved with. It was no child left inside. It was to be a little plant out with, with students at the Keswick Ridge School. We had a, a minister um, of, of the government with us and we had apple growers and teachers and little old me there, but it just didn't seem to, it just didn't seem to root. Now there are programs in Fredericton, but they just seem to just fade away and I don't know the reason and or why. So to me, a native plant is pre-European. It's without any human intervention or whatsoever. Um, now my backyard, I, I deem them as native plants, but to me, they're not because they've been started from seed. Now, I don't know if I can really truly be honest with the audience here today that I'm growing native plants. It's just a term. It's again, you could call them uh, relics, heirloom plants, seeds. I brought seeds in from out of province. Now to me, that's I'm overstepping my bounds. So you, you, you can charge me later with being either true or false. But again, it's just the beauty of what they represent to me. It's just getting on your knees and looking in and smelling and tasting the mud and scaring away great squirrels. I have a problem with squirrels in, this, in, in the town of Fredericton backyard. It's about a three quarter acre property and everything basically is done in plastic pots and I have styroblocks and I do a lot of things from seed. And anybody today who's gonna to start this nursery, get yourself what Thoreau would call a commonplace book. Make notes of what you do. And labels are very important. I don't know what I had for breakfast. I didn't write it down and I've already forgotten. But write in your book what you have done. And the, the time of seed collecting is very important. If you collect too soon, you've lost your stock. You wasted your time. And if you're too late, the gray squirrels are gonna walk off with it. And yes, Gary, I have a problem losing my, uh, my, uh, my, uh, um, my, uh, oh, my, I have bur oak trees and I have a very hard time to collect those because of my enemies. But that's just a few on the, just picking up on the few of the comments. Uh, sedge lawn would be very hard to do. You're gonna have a lot of um, um, IPM and inter integrated pest management. You're gonna have to keep your, your open ground clean from any bare ground is going to invite seeds of invasives. And I call some maple trees in this town invasive maples and dandelion. So you've, it's a lot of work I would think to do a sedge lawn, but I've seen them and, they are, and they're, they're wonderful. Indeed. So I'm just going to start going on the. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying, I'm trying to create your own. I want to make it personal. I want to bring this down to a personal invitation to start your native gardens. I can't do what Gary's doing. I, I, I just, I just can't have four acres or forty acres going on. 
I just want to create something that you like to, to invite your friends in. It's an invitation into what has been pre pre development. I want it to be it's a part of a larger ecosystem. There's, I find no competition in this industry. If we are all into this together with Gary, and if there are a few more industries starting up, I spoke to a young lady who's going to start in Elgin, New Brunswick. I wish her all the best, and I'm open any time for an invitation. I'm really cheap for travel, a cup of tea, and we'll talk about things. It works well. We can exchange seeds. So I'm just creating an NB yard. I'm bringing her again right down to what you like and what you specify in. So this is the, an in, entrance into my lower garden. This was once lawn. I drove my father-in-law's Pinto station wagon down and just removed a little bit of uh, dogwood in the backyard. This was lawn. And this was start again, 96, 97 is when we started putting spade into the earth. Uh, these are these are what this is the uh, stinking Benjamin the plant on the right. This is our trillium erectum, and the sanguinary canadensis, the blood root. These both come very easy from seed. Uh, that trillium on the right, it'll give you about forty seeds, and they'll they will all propagate. You'll have a hundred percent propagation on that, no problem. The Blood root, the sanguinaria, again, the indigenous people, the native people would use the root, the tuber, the rhizome in basket making. It, it, it will indicate that you've touched it because it, it, it will bleach, bad word to use, but it will show on your fingers. Um, very, these are what we term as ephemerals, very early in the year. And last year, these bloom very early, early, early. And I didn't get pollinators on a few of the of my little plants sitting in strata. I have different groups of these around the garden. So the south slope, it was exposed very early and it was cold last spring. So I had no seed from the uh, on that particular set of plants. Again, just the close up. Insect problem, I have none whatsoever, none whatsoever. But again, sowing out seed, it's that ubiquitous gray squirrel. You, he'll get into everything that I have. I, I, I can't have bare ground. It, everything has to be raised or under uh, netting or screen. Now this would be, this is the hepatica. These are a lovely little things. In the shape of the hepatica, this is number five. Is this screen number five? This is a, these are found in dry wood. And again, this, the seed is quite early. It's just sowing the seed out. The division is rather easy for them. You just feather them apart and do it after you flower. Do it after flower and before lock up and before freeze up. And you should have a pretty good go with it. Um, my, my duff, my topsoil, my potting mix, it's, it's, it's compost. And in the last few years, I've been gathering seaweed and I've just been letting the to dry out because there's all sorts of little insects hopping around in the, in the seaweed. I just throw it out on a concrete patio and I have a little extra mix into the seed. I use no chemicals. I have no chemicals on my property whatsoever. I have a, a a flotilla of insects that come in. And Gary mentioned that honeysuckle moth or honeybird moth, strange beast, but yes. I had a leaf cutter bee one time come in and I watched him as he nipped out the plant. And I sat with my cup of tea and he came back and I thanked him for coming back to my plant. How's that? Another shot coming down into the garden. That, that would be the hobble bush that Gary had mentioned the viburnums are a lovely species in the garden. The wild raisin is a viburnum and they're really beautiful for fall cover. It's just uh, Labrador teas. And that's just looking at the screen port. So you're, you're, I'm on a slope facing full south. 
and the groundnut. These, the, the native people would gather them as Indian potatoes and you would, they would taste like a turnip. It's our late fall flowering and I find the blossom smells like cinnamon and it's one of our rare brown flowers, uh, native indigenous to this province. Uh, and that's just an overview. It's just sort of a cluster. In the back top picture would be the um, Bill Thorpe walking trail. That's the uh, footpath that takes you to the north side of the bridge. And in about another two months, I won't be able to see that. Hopefully it's two months. We may, I hope we don't miss the season of spring. Um, here we are, the Erythronium Americanum. This is a, the, the fawn lily, the trout lily, the deer lily. These are, these are wonderful little, these are wonderful little Erythronium. These come very easy from seed. Again, it's, but they do come from seed, but I find more from corms. The corm, if you, you can dig these up and transplant them out, but you've got to, you've got to set the corm at least three inches plus into your biomass or your planting bed. Um, I've dug these in my garden before and the corms would be down six plus inches. It's amazing how a corm moves itself into a deeper depth within the garden. Nature in itself doesn't need me in my backyard. The, the plants don't want me there because they do well on their own. And again, it's just to enjoy and just watch nature as at her best, even in an artificial garden in which mine is. It's just fake things. It's just plastic perpetual care. That's sort of a horticultural racism and, and I apologize for that. Um, this is the Celadane poppy. And again, just a uh, papyrifera family. It's a, again, just a typical um, poppy plant. The seed is being erected. It's being set for seed. Again, just feather it apart put it in a, in, in a pot and I cover it with shade or a, a screen and label it, label it in what time of the year you did it. So you have something to go back to. Dutchman breech, another one. These are very small corms. They almost sit on the top of the ground and they're, in, they're, they're, they're almost visible with the naked eye when you just, you can see the, the pine needles around for a little bit of duff covering. Just to, don't bury the corms too deep, but they're almost a reddish when they sit naked to the sunlight. They're wonderful little, wonderful, just pretty. Um, what do we got here? We have some violas. Now the viola pubescence is the yellow one. This is not the yellow. I done. And I have uh, the tree on the left. It's, it's a blue spruce that came through the front door from the girl guides about 20 years ago. It's just a wonderful little thing. I see, think I'm losing it. It's, it's really, it's becoming stretched where it is. Um, partridge berry, Michella repens. These go well with uh, stoloniferas, laying the plant out in a bed and just between the nodes, it's just cutting the uh, word between the nodes and you don't sever it but just open it to the ground, pin it in place. You have to have it pinned. Again, label it. I'm sorry, you've got to keep notes. You've got to keep notes and just leave it for a year and, and come back the following year and just lift up on the outer side of your cutting and just feather it. And if, and if there's a little resistance, then it has taken root. Then just go above that and you'll have yourself another plant. No seed, just it's, it's called layering, another form of propagation within this, in, within this horticultural industry. There's also uh, mounding, like some trees, like a um, willow are very good for mounding. It's just you bury the stem of the tree. You're digging like a four foot hole and you're dropping the whole plant in, but yet you're, you're um, exposing the inner bark along 
the the bold the trunk of the tree and come spring just bring it out and just massacre it up and you've got a another good a, another good load of uh, willows um the white snow dew this is uh antenaria parlini these are pussy toes this is uh, a narrow uh, sort of a, a ground cover except for the inflorescence that might be a foot high um comes well does well it grows very good um, it doesn't like to be exposed in the winter and if you if you're ever going to design a native garden, make sure where the snow lies and blows and it remains. If the ground is open through the winter, be aware of what you're going to set in there. It may not like it at all. The anterior needs to have a little bit of snow cover. Clintonia, the blue bead. There's very rare blue in nature, not a lot of blue. Again, these are the seeds that need to be sown very quickly. The clintonia, the acetea, the red baneberry, the white baneberry, they need to be sown as soon as you break that pulp. They don't like to be dried out. Again, things are in a pot. Sometimes I'll, on the top, I'll add some perlite or, or vermiculite. I mean, as Gary said, soil is very precious. When, you, when my pot goes out of the yard, I've lost my soil. Jack in the pulpit, Mr. Jack. Apparently, if the soil changes its texture, its moisture, its light control, these things change sex. Right now, this plant's happy because it's in a pot. It's well fed, no chemicals, keep it well watered. And um, pots, the, they have, a, of course, drainage holes. And it, within a natural ball, there is uh, the saturation of but these like to be able to breathe a little bit on that. Now, jacks will change. I don't know why they call it jack. If it's, if it's fertilized, it's chill. And there is chill. That's the seed. And these come very easy from seed. This will change texture. This will go like a, a, a purple and a red. Very lovely in the nature setting. Ah, uh, yes. The Saracena purpurea, the pitcher plant. Um, the indigenous people would use the dried, I guess, the inflorescence. They would drain the water out, of course, and they would use it as a drinking vessel. You don't want to be drinking bugs. This is one of our in, in, in incesticide in, 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 I'm skipping here, it eats bugs. The hairs within the plant point downward. And you might be able to see a couple little smudge spots in the lower left. That's a few bugs being digested within this, this cauldron of death. Now I use these, I don't, I, I can't get seed with these. There's a worm inside the, 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 the blossom. This is my educational plant. I did, yes, I broke the laws. I went onto a property that was being extirpated. I dug this out. This is education only. I don't sell pitcher plants because I can't get them from that point. I find them difficult, Gary. And there's the flower. There's the flower. Jeez, it's kind of neat. You can see the little tub. It's, it's a little baby bird, baby bathtub that I get at a dollar store or something. And there's my other nursery pots packed around. Uh, the witch hazel. Yes, the Himalayas, Virginia. Now, I have to cover, you can see the little bit of the yellow blossom. I have to cover that with a tea bag empty tea bag, of course, because it's like a double shotgun barrel on those puppies and they'll shoot out because the idea in nature is to get the offspring away from the mother plant, less competition. So it's like a, the, the, the seed is collected within the empty tea bag and then I just plant the seed out. Now I have a witch hazel that's like 40 foot tall. It's in a wonderful spot. It's, it's a real knockout. It blooms in October, November. No insect problems, not at all. Squirrels don't like those, so that's okay. The red bane berries, and again on the left, um, again, one of the uh, spring bloomers can be poisonous. These, the Acetea family, the red and the white, Gary had a much better picture than I had. 
they can be poisonous. That's the from the ranunculus family. Um, and the fault Solomon seal, manatheum, these spread. Not invasive, they don't take over. Um, none of my plants are deep rooted. I don't have tap roots like a, a, a bur oak or whatnot. These are very easy manipulated and to move around. And But give the red berry some room. You'll be surprised. Uh, chicory, the chicorum, this is uh, in the, the, uh, the blue sailors. These are used substitute for coffee. You take an awful lot of plant to make a good cup of coffee. So go to your, your ubiquitous shop and maybe you'll win your, your big fortune through your cup. But these are again, the blue with the bane berries, uh, excuse me, the chicory and the clintonia. Um, this is the, um, what is this? What is this, David? Um, oh, blank. We went blank. That's okay. That's okay. How do you know what's going on here? Anyway, that's okay. It's just now these, to me, it has like a little halo. It's again, you, you could label as maybe putting these in your lawn. I think these would would produce much better for you in the lawn because they would give you much a much higher seed content and a higher seed capacity. I think this would be really nice in the lawn. Again, that's that little halo effect. And I don't know, I like it. Now, here's a, back to the viburnums again. We're looking at mid-August here, coming or June. Now, again, with the insects. Um, not changing its color yet, but still they're lovely in the landscape and it's, it just gives a five minutes already. Dear Julie, I thought you invited me. Uh, marsh marigold. Marsh marigold, again, I have mine uh, just indented into the property and the plant sits a little low so we get water from the skies and above and it self waters for me. I have no irrigation. I save water off of the roof. I have bales and plastic bales and garbage cans saving my water. Uh, the butterwort, this is another insect eating. This came in with a seed. You can just see the, the, the pepper on the leaf. It, it will enfold within itself, again, digesting the plant. The spikenard, I like these puppies. This is the Aurelia. Uh, Aurelia racemosa. These are massive. They'll go from zero to like four feet and just expand out in its inflorescence. And it takes up a lot of landscape area. I just tie it back and it's wonderful. Rose twisted stalk. Uh, this is a lily family. If you ever see those little red lily beetles, they squeeze really good between thumb and forefinger. They will desiccate your plant. So it's Integrated pest management that kind of thinks keep things going. On the right is some irrigation pipe. I used to have a little alpine house. They're a lot of work. I, I could never do what Gary does. They're a greenhouse, a coal frame. It's a totally different environment. It can happen within minutes. And this would be what is this again? This is the uh, this is the uh, the rose twisted stalk with its seed. The fleshy seed needs to be cleaned. You can, you, you can keep these over in the winter, but you've got to get the flesh out and dry the seed and again, set them out. Canada lily, Lilium canadensis. These are a knockout. These come really easy from the corn. You dig this puppy up. That's a nice horticultural term, puppy. Lilium canadensis, the Canada lily. And you remove the bulbets off and just plant them out again, row on row. This is just a little backdrop behind a pail. And on the right, you'll see an umbrella. That's my movable ear, uh, my movable shade. You can get these at a yard sale for five bucks. It's a pretty cheap shade. I can move these around with the sun. Uh, Mechanopsis, it's from the seed exchange. They come from Himalaya. I don't sell these a row. This was just a, a blue. And that's a part of the nursery looking in my pots and whatever. Spreading dog bane. This is from the milkweed family. I've had monarchs hit this more than I've seen them on my my milkweed plant, right up through the setting on, on the front of the house. I'm ending up here, Julie, this poor little guy, this little bat, 
the brown nosed bat. I opened up one of my umbrellas one day and the poor little chappy fell out and he landed on that Rubus recurvulata. That must have stung a little bit. And I don't, I hadn't seen bats in ages. And I, this, this little guy, I just, I just sort of left him. I put the shade back down over him and kept him there. And that's just, that's just what nature brings. And uh, be mindful of what you do. Just don't try to change the landscape too much because the plants will let you know what you're doing. Look and listen to the plants and be aware and make a note if any change. Plant, these plants can be moved, but move at the right time, collect your seed at the right time. And again, it's just being mindful of your labels and making your notes and getting hold of me and whoever else is in this industry because it's not competition. It's not about the making the dollar bill. It's about the interest in what we are losing at such an astronomical rate. The north side of this town in Fredericton, it is just sad what's happening. I don't mean to pick on, but we're losing a lot of once was. I guess. Julie. How's that? Yes, that's great. Right okay. on the ball. Right there. Good job, David. <laughs> I, I can go Thank home now? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm joking. Thank you I'm so joking. much. I'm Thank joking. you so much for that presentation. There's a lot of action in the chat. Lots of questions. Okay. So I'll... Yeah, I'll pass the mic off to, to Serge. So we'll have five minute questions and then we'll have a 10 minute break. We just wanna make sure people are moving, not sitting still for, yes. for quite a while because it can get tiresome. Okay, Julie, I'm here. All right, Salj. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much, David. Lots of comments, thoughts um, and questions. Um, some of which I think we'll keep for the discussion later on, but there was a question about um, ethical seed collection. So where yes. can I go to collect seeds? What type of land? And obviously not collecting a large percentage. Do you have maybe under five minutes to talk a little bit about that? I know that doesn't give you a lot of time. Well, no, I can shorten this up pretty good. Ethical seed, of course, you have to be mindful where you are. Don't go on private land. Ask the homeowner. And if you come to this person's property, just don't pick seed that is by the side of the road. Get out of your vehicle, keep your coffee cup in the car, and walk into the field and collect from selective areas because you may get a, a more of a mature and older seed throughout your selection and then mix them all together and then plant them out. And again, where were you? Put it down, label it. I'm sorry about this labeling business, but if you come to a small patch of seed and there are only like maybe three plants, I think I used to go by the 30%. I'm going like, don't like just take two or three or four off. Don't, don't rape everything out just to fill, just to put something in your backyard that may not even survive. Try it out, but just be selective of where you grow and don't be greedy. And just again, it's just the seed and the time of the seed collection. Now, I find that you, you can get a lot of gardening books out there. I just want to put a note out for that. There's, there's beautiful pictures like what Gary had on today. But a lot of the gardening books don't tell you the time of propagation. And that's the trick. Now, I, I was going for a page here on one of the plants. I still can't find what I wanted to talk on. I have some loose papers here on seed and what to start. And I'll, I'm willing to share that with, with other people, of course. But seed... It's fun, it's cheap, but there's all sorts of ways of doing seed also. And it is the time of the seed, time of the season that you want to collect. Correct. There was a question there, and just a fact on that was, you know, do you collect seeds in the spring? Would they be considered to have been cold or to have been stratified? Um, making that information available is something we can certainly help out with as well. And as you say, lots of resources available for that. Well, I, I think it like, seems important. Uh, for me, it is. For me, it is because I, I like to get the stuff that's fresh. Basically, it's it's been it's been set for a reason. It's it's been through nature's calendar herself to get things going to have seed drop off. And if you wait to the spring, you may you the the, the seed possibly 
could become chilled, it could become frozen, it could become damaged. The branch could become damaged. I like, I like fall and setting them out. Now you can stratify seed and put them in your fridge, but again, it depends on, of course, each individual plant is quite different. But no, I, I, I like going out in the fall. Now, I, I do get a lot of my seed from my own garden. And I, it's, it's just with a little three quarter acre. I mean, everything is packed. I usually just let the seed fall on top of the nursery pot. And again, there's not a lot of intervention. There's not a lot of putting too many brackets in the equation, you're gonna to start to have problems. I like to just keep it simple and just again, let the seed develop, let it fall off where it may. Like the trilliums, the, the little seed capsule will land on the ground and every seed will, it will just germinate through that capsule. It's quite amazing. Yeah, but I'm listening to the Monsieur Du. And, um, th thanks, Gary, for adding a good uh, insight there on, on ethical oh, seed yes. questions. Oh, yes. Well, well, the whole, the, this in, whole game, see. In the chat there. Can, can, may I interject on something here? Um, sure. Uh, I think that'll be the last minute, I believe. Okay. That's great, uh, Pliny the Elder once said, there's nothing more important than the commerce of plants. I think what's going to happen now, and I have to be quite leery on this, if, if, if people are really looking for these natives, these antiques, these relics, people may start heading into the woods and digging up. That's my fear. There was a gentleman in the province of Quebec. He was caught with 300 wild onions, the ramps. They're a rare plant in Quebec, and he got 300 in his back pocket. Uh, there's, things, there's things that we have to be aware of. You know, you can't have a policeman behind every tree out there, but there has to be some ethical. And I don't know how you're going to get that through some people. People, human nature is very hard to digest. I'm not, I don't want to be ignorant here. I have a great respect for people who run this and I have a great respect for my neighbor, but if there are just, I, I think wild crafting is going to pose a problem down the road. Thank you. I'm sorry if I've, if I've taken up here. No, you just finished on time. Perfect. Okay, Julie. Thank, thank you, Julie. Yes. Thank you. So we will have our thank second you. break now. So we'll be back. Uh, we'll meet Dak at 2.35. On se rencontre de nouveau à 2 h 35 Pour la deuxième partie de We're back now for the second part of this workshop. We'll have two presentations, one right after the other. So we shall wait for the round table to ask questions. So for the first presentation, we have Ben Whaley of the Academy Cases Watershed Restoration Committee. He will talk about his experience uh, with uh, Willow. with willow cuttings, whenever you're ready, Ben. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much everybody for uh, inviting me to come out today. I gotta be honest, it's uh, gonna be a tough act to follow after David and Gary, and uh, my perspective is going to be a little bit different. Um, I am presenting today Restoring Our Pairing Zone. So we are focused on mainly stream side plantings and that kind of thing uh, on how to do that, how to protect your investment a little bit and why willows are that first line of defense. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen okay. And uh, uh, just to, right off the get-go, I want to put out a bit of a disclaimer. I am talking from New Brunswick and a New Brunswick perspective. Um, so therefore, sometimes I'm going to refer to some regulations and stuff like that. That is only in New Brunswick. So if you're listening to us from outside of New Brunswick, please be aware of the regulations within your own jurisdiction and up update yourself on those uh, uh, those rules that might apply to you. The other thing is this is an Indigenous plant workshop, and while uh, I fully support uh, planting indigenous or native uh, species. Sometimes willow are very difficult to tell apart. Um, and some of the pictures that you're going to see uh, within our work here, we're, you're going to see a non-native willow. Uh, but all of the willow that we are using within the Kennebec Cases Watershed and our, and our riparian restoration efforts have been harvested from historical willow stands that existed along our waterway. So it was something that, you know, we harvested using volunteer effort. So sometimes the identification isn't always 100%. 
And uh, therefore, now we are always going back and taking from those same willow stands over and over again. And you'll see that in a little bit. So a disclaimer that not everything is native that you might see here in some of the photos. So I want to talk a little bit about the different tasks. Um, and I've kind of broke it down to keep it within my 10 minute time frame here to five quick, simple tasks. Identify the healthy willow stands, identify landowners, both where you're going to harvest from and where you might plant from. Harvest and store willow stock, how to do that really quickly. And then prepare and refresh the willow before you start to prepare or, or before you go and strike or stake the willow uh, for the future. Um, so task one is identifying healthy willow stands. If you're a watershed group or water or a community organization that you're looking to do some willow harvesting, one of the things that we've done in the past is actually go out and assess all of our willow stands up and down our waterway. Um, and there were a number of things that we learned by going through that process. Uh, first, how to properly do that. Uh, and it's not rocket science. It, it can be very complicated if you want it to be, but we tried to keep our our overall assessment simple. Uh, you got to know what are you going to be using the willows for? Uh, strikes, stakes, or whips are terms that we use. A strike is basically something that will strike into a jiffy pot and will grow it to a seedling. Uh, a stake is something that we're going to directly stake after soaking and preparing it. We're going to stake it into the ground and let it propagate from a, a stake. And whips are something that we'll use for like uh, brush mats or something like that. And you'll see some examples, hopefully, in a couple of other pictures here in, in a little bit. And if you're going to harvest, you need to know how much willow you're going to harvest. Um, you know, do you need 5,000 stakes? Do you need 5,000 strikes? It's all very different. So when you assess your willow stands, you'll want to cons consider that. Um, also, you'll need to understand, are there invasive species to consider in the stand that you're harvesting from or potentially harvesting from? If there are, you want to take precautions not to take those invasive species somewhere else uh, or where you are going to be staking or using that willow uh, stock later on. Um, can the stand handle being cut back? Uh, how many how many trees are there? Is it a healthy stand? Uh, is it heavily ice inundated? In other words, in the fall of the year, in the, pardon me, in the spring of the year, does it get beat up heavily with ice, that kind of thing? If there is ice, you'll want to kind of resist the ears to go in and harvest a whole bunch off of there because it's going to need that thick stock on that first site um, to combat ice and, and scour from, from that site. Um, can't, or the, the next thing is, and probably maybe one of the most important aspects that you consider in your assessment is can or how accessible is the stand? Um, one of the advantages of using willow staking and, and some of our efforts is we use volunteers to do a lot of the work, the harvesting and that kind of thing, which helps us as a nonprofit leverage some of that in-kind value uh, for future funding. But if we have to walk volunteers two kilometers down a riverbank somewhere to get to a willow stand and then walk back with a whole bunch of willow bundles over our shoulders and stuff, they'll never volunteer for me again. So we try to make sure that the stand is fairly accessible. Task two, identify landowners. This is probably one of the key things that you have to do as a, as, as the organizing organization that's going to go in and harvest willow or, or even plant the willow. Um, harvest site, you need to know who owns the property. You can do that through GOMB or any of those um, um, GIS um, databases that you might have access to. Um, it's fairly simple. If you have a Department of Agriculture contact, uh, like we do, we can get that information on who owns the property and then make a cold call to the property owner. Um, we've got enough history for us now that we actually, most of the sites that we go and harvest from are sites that we established. So we already know who the landowners are and it's become a cyclical thing. And I'll show you that diagram here in a little bit as well. But it's important to talk to the landowners where you're gonna go harvest your willow from um, and make sure that they're okay with you uh, accessing the site using trucks possibly you know, along a waterway or something like that, or parked in their driveway for a short period of time. And you wanna make sure that they're okay with you harvesting off that willow. Uh, educate yourself as to the impacts harvesting willow has and then make sure that you educate the uh, landowner as well. Like let them know that just because you're cutting these willow doesn't mean you're going to destroy them. It doesn't mean that they're not gonna be healthy in the future, that you're gonna do your due diligence and make sure that the stand remains healthy moving forward. At the planting site, you'll also need landowner permission. Um, and what we do there is we do a restoration site plan. So we visit the landowner, we'll do a restoration site plan. Uh, we'll also ask questions around his infrastructure. Does he have water and sewer on site somewhere? Does he have, if he's a farmer, does he have drainage tile? If so, we don't plant willow near any of that drainage or any of that infrastructure because of the risk of possible root clogging of uh, any pipes intake or outtake pipes um, for water. So we make sure that we have a really 
firm conversation with the landowners on that. Uh, the other thing that you might want to enter introduce the lender to is bees. Uh, willow are very um, popular when it comes to pollinators, including bees and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I've been stung before going into a harvest site. Um, so if you're going to go in and plant a bunch of willow and the landowner doesn't want a bunch of bees, or maybe he wants bees, inform him of that, you know, there's a great opportunity for an increase in pollinators, but there's also a risk of getting stung. So if he has allergies or anything like that, he may not want to see you plant a bunch of willow there or anything for that matter. We don't run into that too often, but it is an important conversation to have just for liability purposes. Class three, harvest and store willow stock. Um, we harvest during cold, uh, colder weather, March, early April. We can vary this a little bit. If we're using stakes, for instance, we can actually harvest stakes uh, clean throughout the season, uh, provided we harvest, or pardon me, provided that we soak those stakes uh, for 48 hours. Um, so if we soak those stakes and then drop them into our planting medium, if, if we're, again, that's usually just natural ground or natural soil somewhere. If we're doing that, we can soak them 48 hours from the time of harvest till when we're ready to use them and, and they're good to go. If we're doing strikes, um, in other words, we're, we're propagating them to seedling, we like to have them in, in the cold uh, before they start to grow. Uh, so we harvest those usually March, early April. We take them to our nursery. We'll strike them into a, into a planting medium usually in early May. Uh, and then they're usually ready by uh, mid, mid June for planting along our wetter riparian zones. Uh, if you're doing this, make sure that you're using sharp equipment. Sharp shears is important. A clean cut uh, improves your overall performance of the willow. Um, if you have a clunky knife or a dull pair of shears that are leaving bark scars and stuff like that on your on your stock, uh, you're going to have more instance of die off, or you're not going to have as good of strike or a stake success as well. Uh, it tends to lead to uh, a little bit of problems. Yeah, got it. Uh, volunteers are important. You can get volunteers that way. iNaturalist on site is a, an important way to do so. When you're on the site, you can actually move through iNaturalist or have your volunteers use iNaturalist. And for your harvest, you don't need a wah wah permit. Storing, if you're storing them below freezing, as I said, you need to keep them dry. You can store them in longer lengths and freshen them off into shorter lengths. Uh, you'll require some freezer space. We have a freezer here that we keep ours in, but you can count your bundles as well. So keep them counted so that as an organization you can then have a better idea of how many you put into the ground which that's really it's easier to count them when they're in those bundles and, and nice little uh, organized uh, bundles as opposed to once you get them out in the ground you try to go back and count each one you planted that is a difficult task. Task four is the strikes and stakes again so what you see in the picture is a number of strikes at a nursery uh, you need some pre-planning to do that you have to have a conversation with a greenhouse locally but you can do volunteers to do it you can grow a large number that way, uh, but you require a lot of space. It does cost a little bit of money. Um, we basically pay, we've worked out an agreement with some of our local nurseries where they provide the space, we provide the jiffy pots and all the materials they need, but they also provide some of the watering and stuff like that uh, uh, at no cost. Uh, so it, it can be, uh, now I have that relationship, not everybody's gonna have that. Uh, stakes, they require less planning, they're harder to store. Uh, they are less successful. So we get about a 65 to 72% success rate on our strikes. We only get about a 60 to 65% success rate on our stakes. Uh, you can still use volunteers. You can plant a large number still, and they do cost a little less overall. Here's a cycle aspect of it, and you'll see some pictures here. Uh, in the, the left-hand side, we have a volunteer cutting some of the willow stock. In the bottom, they're striking them as a, as a willow to go uh, to the nursery. Um, then you take the stock out to your site and you can either plant it or prepare it for being used as a brush mat, which is what you see in the top right corner. And then over time, you'll see what you see in the center top is a healthy riparian zone. Uh, so willow first line of defense. The reason why they're a great line of defense is they have a high root mass um, that helps resist erosion, helps keep soils back along an eroding stream bank. They grow quickly, so they can make a very quick impression on your before and after photos. Um, and for funders that might tour the site, uh, they're very resilient. They can get knocked down by ice and then they will come back up rather quickly. They act as guards to the upland. So that thick growth of willow that you see uh, can actually provide protection for 
the species that you might get from Dawn or, or uh, other, other nurseries around. And so therefore, um, you protect that investment, that more expensive investment of, you know, your butternut, your bur oak, your, your swamp oak, your hemlock, your cedar. So you're protecting that. Uh, it also provides a wide range of habitat. Uh, willow provides a huge amount of bird habitat, a huge amount of pollinator habitat, great corridor uh, protection and hiding spaces for uh, small terrestrial animals as well. So it's great that way. And then I can go on and on about the protection it provides to rivers and streams. So it's important for us to take um, sites that look like what you see in the top left. And again, uh, that picture, the pictures are a bit grainy because they come off of, uh, of an old document that we have. So uh, the picture that you see on the left is a degraded riparian zone. 10 years later, after doing some riparian zone planting and, and willow uh, planting, uh, you see the picture that's there on the right. So thank you very much. Uh, I wish I had a little bit more time to go a little bit more detail on that, but it is um, it is uh, what it is. And uh, the Wawa permitting process is one, one thing that you should consider as well. So I did have on there a slide that had Wawa. Um, to plant the trees, you need a Wawa. To harvest willow stakes, you don't need a Wawa, which is a bit, irony, a bit ironic, but it is the case. And thank you very much. And I'll share my screen. Thank you again. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Sorry, I don't like to be the one that tells no, people. No, no, that's like, fair. You gave me. <laughs> but you, you did an awesome job. Then. You did an awesome job. Thank you so much. So we'll move things along with uh, Claire. Yeah, great. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, so thanks for handing it off, Ben. And I'm finishing up our presentations for the day, but certainly we've had some great ones so far. Um, so just to start, my name is Claire Ferguson, and I work with the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. And today I'm going to be talking about invasive species and how you can be plant wise this upcoming year. So before I get into talking about the details, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our organization. So we are a nonprofit based out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, although we travel across the province. And we are guided by a steering committee that has um, various different inputs and outlooks that are represented from across the province. And we are a chapter of the National Canadian Council on Invasive Species. So our mission as an organization is to protect New Brunswick's environmental, economic, and recreational interests from the threat of invasive species. So the main three areas that we work with um, are education and awareness, so doing presentations like this. We also help to facil facilitate collaboration amongst many different partners to help improve management of invasive species. And we also work to provide knowledge to our various partners and groups across the province so that they don't have to go through that journey themselves. So to get everyone on the same page, uh, you may ask, what are invasive species? So when we talk about invasive species, for us, a species has to meet these three criteria to be considered invasive. So the first one is that it is non-native. So that means it is not something that is originally from our area. So it could be that it is native to a completely other, completely different other continent, or even it's native to another part of Canada as well. The second factor is that it spreads very rapidly. So it's a species that if it is introduced to a new area, it will either, if it's an animal, have many, many offspring, or in our case today, if it's a plant, that means that the plants will grow and spread very rapidly and could take over a natural area. And the third factor is that it is harmful in some way. So it could be that it is harmful um, to our environment, to our ecosystems, and this, but this could also mean that it is harmful to various recreational activities or even to human health. So for something to, to round that up, for something to be considered an invasive species, it has to be non-native, spread rapidly, and harmful. 
So I did want to clarify before going ahead that not all non-native species are invasive. So an example of this would be the common tomato plants that many of us have in our gardens. So oftentimes those are not a native species. However, as many of us have experienced, you need to give lots of care um, to tomato plants and if left to their own devices, they wouldn't take over a natural area. So this is a distinguishing factor of something a plant or another species meets all these three criteria, then we would consider them to be invasive. Um, now, there are many different impacts that invasive species can have. So focusing more so on the plant and gardening aspects today, um, it would be species that would compete with our native plant species for space or food. So this example here is garlic mustard, which is commonly found in areas across the province. And as you can see in the photo, it is completely taken over that forest floor. So there being very few other native species in there. Um, once an invasive species is also um, brought into an area, if it takes over and only leaves small section of native plants, then that means our native wildlife species will be um, predating and eating more of those native um, species that we have, which would reduce those populations. And now to jump into the more socioeconomic and health related aspects, um, they can have impacts to human health. So this example that is on the screen is of giant hogweed, which is found in a few spots throughout the province. And this is certainly a plant that if you do, you do not want to come into contact with, but if you do, um, you have to be very cautious where the sap, if interacting, if it interacts with the sunlight, can actually cause very serious burns. And to move ahead, um, invasive plants can also impact different infrastructure. So this example here is Japanese knotweed, another very common plant in, found in the province, but the rooting system is so strong with this plant that it can actually break through concrete. So you can only imagine the risks that it would pose if it's found near a foundation or sidewalks. And also when we do have invasive plants that are introduced to um, some of our sensitive habitats, such as wetland and riparian areas, they can also alter how those ecosystems function. And so they may not function as well as they would if only native species were found there. So the question that many would ask is why can't you just get rid of them? So there are many different issues that we face when either trying to remove an invasive or to eradicate and control it. Oftentimes these activities are very, very labor intensive, they're very time consuming, costly, and unfortunately can be minimally effective. So what we are trying to do as an organization is to teach people how to prevent these introductions from happening in the first place to prevent and prevent them from spreading further. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a brand new program that we are rolling out in New Brunswick, which is the PlantWise program. So this is a national program that is seen across the country that supports uh, first the ornamental horticultural industries transition to become invasive free. And it's also to try and help gardeners and different industry members understand which plants are invasive and how they can harm our communities as well as then making plant-wise choices. So choices that would prevent these invasives from being introduced to your gardens. Uh, with this plant-wise program, we also have another program with it called Grow Me Instead, which is to let people know about various invasives and then provide native alternatives that can fill those gaps um, as well. And I did wanna say, well, this is a bit more focused on plants, um, the PlantWise program does also include other aspects of gardening, which would be soil, as well as pond and aquarium plants too, and zero scapes, although it's not quite as common in our area. So here are a number of ways that you can be PlantWise. 
So the first and foremost one, which was mentioned um, by various other presenters today, is to select plants that are not only native to our region, but also ones that are going to successfully grow within your garden conditions. So make sure that you're choosing native plants that will grow well where you're trying to grow them. So if they need wetter and more moist soil conditions, make sure that's something that you're keeping an eye out for. Uh, we also want to encourage people to purchase locally grown or sourced plants and seed mixes because most of the times your nurseries will have some native plant species available. Um, but also make sure that they are properly labeled. And so when you're purchasing a plant, make sure the label does include the scientific uh, name on that as well. So you can make sure you know what species you are buying. This is a big one for those looking at their um, gardens now is be very wary of using wildflower or pollinator seed mixes because often they are not specific to our area and can include invasives. So make sure to research what species are found in that mix. And if you find an invasive plant in your garden, make sure to dispose of that properly. So do not put any invasive plants in your compost because that is how they can escape and go to different areas. So ideally we recommend to put invasive plant materials and seeds into one or two garbage bags and then bring them to your local landfill so that they do not end up in your natural areas. Some a few other steps is to make sure to inspect your garden and the plants that you're buying for any unknown or unusual other hitchhikers. So this could be the plant themselves or other plant seeds that have um, been found in the pot. But this also could be insects, worms, and signs of disease. And finally, we want to encourage everyone to um, talk to your local botanical gardens, nurseries, garden centers, and gardening clubs, and to try to promote the selling of native plants um, and to make sure that they are including scientific names on their labels as well. So I won't go into these in detail, but here are just a few of the many gardening related invasive species that have been found in the province. Um, the three up top, which are English ivy, Japanese barberry and oriental bittersweet um, can be found in various nurseries and garden centers across the province. However, they are highly invasive. Um, Japanese knotweed and Phragmites are ones that are not seen quite as often in our garden centers, but started off as horticultural plants and sometimes are currently being maintained. So these are ones that if you have it, you want to make sure to um, A, let us know that you have it, particularly with Phragmites, and to look into properly trying to remove the species so it does not spread further. And one that I also wanted to put on everyone's radar, which was discovered in the last year in New Brunswick is jumping worms. So these are another, so although our earthworms are all non-native, these ones are particularly harmful to gardens and forested areas and have been found in potted plants um, and vermiculture and vermicompost. So this is certainly one to keep an eye out for. Now, as far as identifying and reporting invasive species, um, as for identification, um, we want to encourage everyone to learn how to identify invasive plant species. And once you do, try and keep an eye out for them. So I wanted to let everyone know today that currently we are working on a Grow Me Instead guide that is specific for New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, which is being done in partnership with the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, the Harriet Irving Botanical Garden and Center at Acadia University. And we have received um, lots of different guidance and feedback from many nurseries across the two provinces, including some on this call today. So this will be um, a booklet that has over 50 invasive plants that are found throughout both of the provinces and many native alternatives. So this is some a guide that is coming very soon. So keep an eye out for it. And I also did wanna throw it out too, that for those that are associated with nurseries across New Brunswick, we are currently trying to gather more information on who is selling different native plant species and what their availability is because 
We're hoping that as we continue to grow our PlantWise and Grow Me Instead guide, that we can um, share that information with the public that are looking for these invasives. So if you do have that information, you're selling native species, um, our program director, Kristen, is going to put that survey on the chat, and it would be great for you to reach out. We'd love to be in contact with you. And on the reporting side, if you do think that you have found an invasive plant or other species in your garden, um, please put those observations on either inaturalist.ca or reach out to us directly to report them because we are currently trying to gather more information about invasive species across the province. So I just want to say thank you so much for inviting uh, me to this presentation today. And if uh, here's our website, email, and our social media if you want to reach out and learn more. And I'm happy to answer more questions about invasive species. That's great. Thank you, Claire. Great presentation. So we'll move over to the um, uh, panel discussion. Donc, la, la discussion de table ronde. We're moving to the panel discussion. I'm not certain, Nathalie, if we want to put the panelists uh, uh, vertically or do we want to keep all of the images? Uh, I'm going to let Serge uh, speak for this uh, part of the presentation before continuing with questions. Just put into the chat, lots of things going into the chat right now. Um, there is a survey there and I'll try to put it again. There's a link to what is an evaluation Form. So I want to just send that around and if folks could take just a couple of minutes to as you depart or as you're listening in on the conversation or after, of course, uh, click on that link and that'll bring you directly to the uh, evaluation form. So it's a bilingual version there. And I'll just uh, I'll just put the link once again in the chat. It'll be up there. It's a Google link. Um, we just want, want to let you know that there was a bit of preparatory work to this conference to the workshop and it was in the form of a survey that was sent out speaking of surveys um thanks claire by the way in terms of putting into perspective the importance of working with nurseries and the availability of certain plants and, and be conscious of that the survey we sent out had that sort of in mind and there was a version sent to groups organizations individuals who undertake restoration work and also a, a format of the survey the questionnaire that went to nurseries or businesses that already propagate and sell plants. So I just want to give you a really quick, quick overview of some of the answers and some of the feedback we got. So over 15 different organizations answered, uh, most of whom uh, are engaged in smaller scale projects that's under 500 plants in a year, uh, which in my mind is a decent size. Um, some of the biggest challenges identified were, of course, in terms of supply from local businesses. Um, it's difficult for a local nursery to, to to source out a native species, especially especially from New Brunswick, um, and most especially for specific projects along coastal restoration, uh, for instance, things like marine grass, wild rules. Um, and then also with these local businesses, uh, they, they have a lack of knowledge in terms of native plants, as do those uh, conducting some of the work too. So lists of native plants do exist uh, and making them more accessible, it would be helpful. And the prices are too high, especially for the types of projects we're working on, which kind of leads into what some of the businesses have told us in terms of why they don't offer and why they don't propagate plants. It's because the cost is too high. Operating costs, heating, staff, greenhouse maintenance uh, being kind of the main ones. Um, not enough equipment, not enough irrigation system, not enough staff, and also their lack of knowledge of how, of how to propagate some of the species. And uh, and not enough space in the, in the current installation. So with that, we sort of take off or take away from the, the survey and to build that into a bit of a discussion now. And so got a couple of questions, um, but some, you know, there's been good discussion already with the great uh, knowledge being shared. And I, one of the instances was about this idea of what, how do we overcome that challenge? Um, so if as a, as a collective or as organizations or individuals who are either working towards propagating and been at it for years, wanting to do it or needing native plants, sort of what, what's been that challenge in, ter in terms of um, capacity for it? So what's been the challenge in terms of 
uh, in terms of availability. Um, so I wonder if we can just maybe an open open up to that, uh, open up with that, and um, just kind of lead the discussion from there. And then of course, what's that? What was perhaps in your experience the biggest challenge, and uh, how was that overcome? And I'll open up the question sort of initially to our presenters, to, to Gary, and David, and, and Ben. Um, but uh, I'd like to kind of open it up more widely too for either answering that. What's been your challenge? How have you, come, how, how have you overcome it? Um, shall I sort of ask Gary to begin <laughs> thinking of how the presenters, the lineup for the presenters were and putting you on the hot seat? Sorry, Gary. No, um, we've always said we will teach people how to grow plants. If not, we'll teach you how to, you know, collect them from places where you can collect them easily, like ditches are great for that in a lot of cases. And if you can't, I'll sell you some plants, but it's the least of my interest, really. I know it helps us, but I would rather see if somebody goes out and is growing a lot of stuff and they're doing my work, right? Because there's a there's a 100,000 yellow birch or red oak or hemlock that could go into island forests and we can't produce them all. Mm. So I think lots of times people think it's much more complicated than it is. So, you know, again, I don't have any training in any of this stuff. We just figured out how to do a lot of it. I think in a lot of cases, it's easier than we think. I'll, I'll second that, Serge, if I can. I, I, I mean, we plant a ton of trees, not just willow. We plant a ton of trees, and they don't always work where we think they're going to work. Um, it requires a lot of a bit, well, not a lot of, but a little bit of research as to what works where, a little bit of experience too. Like, uh, you know, we've been, the Katie Bruce has been planting trees for over 20 years now. So it takes a little bit of experience, a little bit of time. Um, and in our situation, I think sometimes people want to see an immediate change to the, to the ecosystem health. And planting trees is not, I, I think, uh, again, I'm going to mess this quote up, but I, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. And if not, then today, well, th the reason why is 30, if you had planted 30 years ago, you could reap the reward today. Um, and, and it takes that long to before we start to see the benefits of some of these plantings that we put in place. It, it's not just, you know, we can't just snap our fingers. For some of those flowering plants, sure, it, maybe you can plant them and next year, you'll get some nice flowers, but it's not always that simple. David, did you want to add something to that in terms of, you know, what was maybe a challenge you were able to overcome um, in terms of propagation, getting the word out, getting some plants available to people? David, we still have you on mute. If you can, are you comfortable with unmuting? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, sorry, sorry, Serge. That's okay. The question, good question. I'm sure everybody's heard it and making notes and intent on what my answer is. Well, I don't have all the answers, but in the early January, Julie called me up and said, what's going on out there? And I said, well, there's not a lot, but if we got together on this as a small industry between us, between Gary and Ben and whoever else, Gary could grow a certain plant, I could grow a certain plant, and as one entity, we could probably fill a few contracts. As Gary said, I have no room to put in 400 birch trees in my yard. So I think you have to be sort of site specific on where this project is going, because it's gonna take time to grow trees and get them to an area that you can pot them out bare root or in styrofoam or whatever else. But for me in the early years, it was, Hal Hines once said, do not open your nursery with no inventory because people will remember that. So a lot of years I went just under, under the airwaves. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing because I had to get the stock up. And they have to be ethical with that stock up. You can dig on Sunday, but Monday it's not gonna live. You have to be a little bit of morale on this also what you're spending. So New Brunswick is really, big in the native. I found that it came from West when I started this and it was like the divine wind from Vancouver, all of the big native spill. But I, it's picking up here now. I find it's really coming. There's a lot of people that have a love for this province and what we have and to respect different nations and different people and how they live and talk. Maybe people don't like wildflowers, they treat them as weeds but it's to get us out as an entity, be aware of what we've got, be mindful of how we grow it, 
But for me in the early years, it was just slow and work away and shoo away the gray squirrels and have fun and just continue on in life. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to take time and it's going to take time, but we're there. We're, we're all ready to go. I appreciate you asking us to be mindful. I think that's a piece that we sometimes get caught up in just planting where we need to plant and trying to, trying to well, it's not also put as many in, but you know, it's, it's appreciated. Right. And it can it become the, the commercialization of plants too. Mm -hmm. But I think there's more in it than money. I, I think there's an understanding of the ecosystem and what, like uh, Claire mentioned about the Calamagrastus grass. I mean, that is just an ungodly thing to get into the riverways. So there have to be ways in which to mitigate that. And just, it takes time. You, 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 you just can't hope for the spring and, and make your money. That's not where it is. Money burns, I'm sorry. It, it takes time and, oh. and with us together, we're okay. Great, If I, I'll just spread the invitation out to those. I know it's difficult, but six, well, just under 70 participants now to maybe feel the courage to raise your hands, but there's many people who are on the call here today who've had their experiences as well. So I, I encourage you to, to raise your hand and we'll try to get to, to your comments. And Ben, you wanted to add something there, I think? Yeah, I'll just add it because you're you're speaking of challenges, Serge, and about finding native plants. And and again, for us, uh, you know, I don't I don't know a whole lot about plants. To be honest, I'm a I'm a fish guy. That's how I got my job. I was more of a fish biologist. Um, but uh, I'm learning every day, like I said earlier. But sometimes I go to a nursery and I'm trying to source out. And because our funders require us to have native plants, it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between a native and a cultivar or a native and uh, an introduced species sometimes. And sometimes the nurseries don't even know either. Like they're, you'll, buy a, you'll buy a plant from a nursery and they'll, they're telling you it's native or that it's a native um, you know, cultivar. And then I get it back to my site and I do a little bit more digging and I realize that's not what I ordered. I need to go back to the nursery. So there is a challenge that way as well. And it'd be great if we could overcome that or if somebody had some comments on that. Well, the horticulture I see Claire's got her, your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just also wanted some of the, so although we're kind of early in the process of starting to navigate this, something through our survey that we did get as a few responses from nurseries um, is some have had a percep perception that the public is not very interested in getting native species, which I think is certainly changing and groups like this are, you know, certainly showing there is that change. So I think that's something that is shifting, but certainly has been a barrier. And something else that came up to us as a challenge is nurseries, um, as mentioned today, are having sometimes a hard time sourcing native species themselves, themselves. And then when they do have plants in stock, um, they're in, in high demand. So lots of people are trying to get those. So I think that's our, certainly something that over time may ch will change. And as you know, what we're hoping to do with our survey is at least if we know one or two, a few nurseries have a few different species that we can direct people to, that would be great. But I think it's really changing the percept, you know, public perception of, you know, searching out and seeking native species and then giving people the chance um, and opportunities to find where they can actually source those. Great. Thanks, Claire. Um, I see Gary has his hand up. I also see Kristen. Kristen, Kristen so, had her hand up. Chris, and I see Karen Rogers, perhaps, might have had something to add. So why don't we go Kristen, then Gary, then Karen? Is that okay? Go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, sure. I just want to um, build on to what Claire was saying. Um, the one thing that, you know, we've, I've learned through the process of trying to go through this Grow Me Instead guide um, is that, you know, we've seen them be developed in other jurisdictions. And one of the, some of the feedback we've heard from that is that the, the species that they're listing in these Grow Me Instead guides, um, people aren't able to get their hands on them. So it, it, there's really no point in recommending a species for somebody to plant if it's not available for them, because they're just going to take the easier route and go plant what they, you know, what they originally intended. Um, so that was a big thing for us when we were trying to put the recommendations together of what species to include in this guide and what alternatives to suggest. We were trying to balance 
you know, what is available for, you know, somebody to get their hands on? Is it really difficult? Because if so, you know, there's no point in us recommending it. If it's, if it's a species that currently, you know, uh, nurseries can't overcome the challenges of sourcing, then it's not, you know, not an ideal for us to put that in there anyway. Not that we don't want to start to push the, you know, push the envelope a little bit, because the idea is we want to try and naturally shift the market, right? A lot of really large uh, nurseries and retailers, there is an economic bottom line. And a lot of the species that are invasive are top sellers, like uh, Japanese barberry, top 10 seller, Norway maple or Crimson King, top best seller, right? So asking a nursery to say, hey, stop selling that is not going to go over well. So what we want to do with these recommendations is try to shift the market away and shift the demand away from those invasive species onto the native species. So then they're going to take a bit of a less of an economic hit, right? So it's it's walking that fine line and it's not something that we're going to be able to do overnight. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that um, and work with industry to make that transition as smooth as possible. Um, the other thing I, I also, I'm thinking, you know, we have a lot of people um, on the call and I don't know how, you know, are a lot of people probably are already aware of invasive versus native plants and wanting, you know, the value of planting native, but for the average gardener who walks into Canadian Tire, the Walmart Garden Center, Superstore, right? Like, you know, starting off, they just want something that's this color, it's going to be easy to grow and, you know, whatever. So a lot of, and I've had the exact same experience where a lot of the staff working in these places don't realize that they're different. They don't know that there's a difference between cultivars. Uh, I didn't know there was a difference between cultivars and true native plants until I started this. Um, so there, there's a huge effort that we need to put towards educating um, the, the, these larger uh, these larger retailers and employers, because I'm assuming a lot of people on the call already know a lot about this kind of stuff, right? Like we're trying to um, we're trying to reach out to the masses for those people like myself who do not have a green thumb, who have very limited understanding, um, and are so that they can walk into a uh, a nursery or somewhere and say, "I would like something like this." And if they're pointing at Japanese barberry, the staff in those nurseries can say, "Okay, well, have you actually thought about this alternative?" Because they recognize that it's invasive and they're uh, um, identifying that, oh, here's what this customer is kind of looking for, and I'm going to make this recommendation. So I think it's not just about um, increasing the supply. It absolutely is. Uh, that's, that's a huge hurdle. But I think in order for us to be able to increase the supply at a large scale, we need to increase that demand first mm -hmm. because of how linked plant choices are to economic returns for some of these really, really large retailers. Right, and having um, this recording perhaps will be one little step towards that. And Gary's great talk, and and, and David's as well. Um, just before I go to Gary, I believe I'll just mention that on the schedule we have like a three twenty five wrap up, um, but we're still available. That's not the call doesn't get shut down at three twenty five. If you want to stay later, uh, by all means, uh, please do. And I've just put into the chat again the uh, evaluation form. So if you're feeling like 325 is your limit, you got to go. Um, just please uh, fill out that form before you leave us. So go ahead, Gary. I just wanted to add that when we started McPhail, I, before McPhail, I worked as a tree planter for the province, and we would be planting white spruce and white spruce and white spruce or black spruce. And I was always dumb, naive, and saying, why don't, why don't you grow more trees? Why aren't we planting other things? And they said, oh, we, we can't grow those trees. And they would plant six or seven um, conifers and in, in their nursery, in the greenhouses, and maybe two or three small numbers of some hardwoods and shrubs are unheard of. And when the watershed group started buying trees from us, and again, we tried to create that change. So we went out and did a ton of talks to the watershed groups. They started buying trees from us. Forestry noticed that. They started growing more species. So now we have probably one of the best forest nurseries growing a wide variety of trees. And I think part of that is from pushing things and the watershed group saying, we need shrub, we need other things, and you're not delivering them. So we're going to bring horse trailer out to McPhail Woods. We're going to buy plants. So I think change sometimes happens not from people waiting and, and sort of almost blaming the public for not wanting things better, but we religiously give workshops on native plants, on landscaping, on wildlife enhancement. And I think 
for a, over a long period of time, that's really helped drive change. Thanks, Gary. Karen, can I ask you to unmute and yeah. please contribute? Great. Hi, um, my name is Karen. I'm, I live in uh, Riverview, New Brunswick, and I'm a volunteer with the Butterfly Wave Rangers, Dr. Suzuki Foundation a program. And so it's, it's all volunteers it's right across Canada. I know some of you are familiar with, with it, and uh, I know there are some other rangers here. But one approach that um, I've taken with developing um, like pollinator gardens is kind of our, our, our focus. And so we've had pollinator gardens in all the schools in Riverview now and a couple in, in Moncton. But what we found, the two of us, there's just two of us in Riverview, um, is we approached the municipality and uh, got a small grant and they allowed us to do um, some pollinator gardens um, in the community. So the, now the idea is that we collect seeds from those and then we're growing more uh, plants that we will then uh, provide to the community through like block parties and um, other initiatives we're doing. But now also, which is wonderful, is that now the municipality is kind of um, uh, on board with us a little bit more, is they're looking at, well, what are they planting in, in their gardens? What are they planting in their in their pots that they put in? So now they're looking at getting, at, at growing their own native plants to put in the community, which I hope then will educate the community, which will then create a demand, which then when we go to the, the nurseries, you can say, oh, look, this is this is doable and, and there is a demand for this. And, and these are the species that, um, that we can provide to people and they can start reducing their, lawn, their lawns of deserts and, and putting in, in, in uh, pollinator gardens and, and shrubs and trees that support our, our biodiversity. So anyway, that was just one project that, that I'm involved with that I thought people might be interested in. And um, it's open to everyone and it's free. <laughs> anyway, my two cents. That's great, Karen. Thanks for sharing that. Is it possible to put your website or Facebook page in the chat? Perhaps you already have them. There's a lot happening in the chat right now. Yeah, so that's great. That. Building that capacity is so important. Um, Kagan, did you want to add? I think you had put something in the chat earlier related to Gary's suggestion as well. Um, but anyway, feel free to, thanks for joining us and look forward to hearing. Hi, my name is Tegan Wong Doherty. I'm from the Knowlesville Art Nature Center and it's been a great presentation all around. Um, I just have a very specific question in terms of when you, and Gary, I saw in your, in your gardens that landscaping, you included like red baneberry. And what came up for me was just, you know, that it's, uh, it's poisonous and how much education do you feel is necessary mm -hmm. to just make sure that those red berries aren't picked and eaten for some reason? Yeah. Um, it's a good point. We generally don't landscape with the red baneberry. The first one we showed was my place and I don't mind having poisonous plants around. I do think we need to talk to people more about what's poisonous in the woods. And, you know, we've always said to kids, don't eat anything unless you know what it is, right? And it's not guessing, it's knowing what it is. And that's a really useful thing because that gets them involved with plants. Um, but I am careful if people are saying they want to buy something and their grandkids are going to be around and they may not talk to them, then we, then we won't sell it to them. But I don't think we can, I don't think we should avoid poisonous plants. No, and it looked gorgeous. So I was just, I just was curious because I've always avoided it, but I liked that it was included there. And I was just wondering what your practices were. So thank yep. you. I want to switch the, the focus maybe of the conversation a little bit, although um, Gary and the example you provide, I think that's doing that. And it was with this thought of, of um, those who are participating today, what is one, what is the number one thing that we can do as a collective or as organizations or as individuals um, to improve the availability of local plants, local native species, so access to native species. So if there had to be one thing, uh, and maybe we can start with the presenters again, um, you know, it's sort of maybe that takeaway message or that one thing that would bring us back together at an in-person session at one point, um, if you can think a little bit about that. And I'm just gonna ask a question to Nathalie about whether or not um, the chat is recorded, some really great information, great resources being shared. If the transcript of that is recorded, we can somehow get it to folks. Uh, I do plan on recording it. 
uh, I guess we could share it with uh, the email if people are interested in it, or maybe send an email to me if you'd like to have the recorded transcripts. I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you. Great. So if we were to leave with one takeaway, I know there's way more than that. Um, something or even something that you find yourself through today or just through recent research or uh, learnings uh, are looking to, to take on to improve access for native species in, in your situation. One of the things we're trying to set up on PEI and I'm particularly interested in is having at least one small nursery in each county and they would focus on the rare plants in their area. So up west would be ironwood and coneflower and things like that. Out east might be other things. And I think it doesn't mean that you can't share. They would obviously be able to share stuff, but we would develop more expertise in that and pride, I think. So it's special that there's ironwood around Halliburton with western parts of PI. And I think that's how you get some buy-in from the local community is that there's something special about where we live, right? There's something special about protecting these plants. So hopefully over the next year or two or five, we'll get that off the ground. Is that something as you, that your organization is spearheading or is it more through the collective? It's more me pushing it, but we've been talking to uh, watershed groups. We do a lot of work with the watershed groups. And I think it's also something that we could be doing with the indigenous uh, organizations mm -hmm. as well, because their plant lists are slightly different. We're, we are growing some black ash and some medicinals and stuff but it would be really interesting for uh, people in those areas to be spearheading that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for recognizing that. Well, we're getting close to 3.30. I just wanna make sure yep. we respect everybody's time. I've been the annoying one that's been telling people, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> So I just want to like do a quick wrap up, but we can certainly continue the discussion until four o'clock if every like if anyone wants to stay a little bit longer. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to all the presenters. You did an awesome job. A lot of information um, was shared. Very interesting information and a lot of action in the chat. So we see there's a lot of interest among um, a lot of people. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to the interpreters, Mariette and Jocelyn. Uh, thank you to all the partners and the funders, the ETF, Environmental Trust Fund, for making this uh, workshop a reality. Uh, thank you so much to everyone that participated. We had a lot. <laughs> we didn't expect this much participation. This is great. Uh, we see there's a need and a want for more uh, Indigenous plants, so that's great. Um, before you go, we just want to make a small announcement. We do have another workshop next week uh, on Wednesday, March 22nd. It'll be in the afternoon and it's on uh, the impact of climate change on surface and under and groundwater. So if you're interested, you can go on the NBN uh, website and you can register for that. And as I said, um, if anyone wants to stay a little bit longer to keep the conversation going, we're, we're willing to do so. But if not, thank you so much for coming by and participating and sharing ideas. We, we love to, we love to hearing from you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Julie, for that wrap yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, don't forget those who are leaving us. There's uh, the evaluation form. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, we Gary like and feedback. yeah, the feedback is important to mm -hmm. improve and keep things going. And if Gary and David and Ben and Claire are still available for a few minutes, that would be great. There's still a couple of hands raised. Uh, I see Kristen. You have your hand raised. Good, thanks again. Hi. Great. Um, the oh, what was I? Okay, no, that was it. Okay. <laughs> I know that was a few <laughs> statements ago. Probably. Yeah, no, no, we had a, um, there was a question that came up earlier in one of the talks about the regulatory rules around what you're allowed to take and not take. Um, I know we've, we've discussed the ethical considerations when it comes to harvesting um, species, but does anybody know if there are rules on har harvesting on in from the wild? Um, Great and point. it may differ from province to province, of course. Yeah. 
Thanks there, for bringing that none. up. No, I'm not there's aware none. of any. No. no. Okay. Because, oh, because one of the things that we, um, a couple of people are saying is, you know, having nurseries in different places that have at least, you know, it's great to have, okay, these folks are working with witch hazel and these one, you know, maybe a nursery or specializes in a couple different ones, um, you know, spread the workload out. But one of the, one of the things that uh, has come up in conversation uh, and ideas we were having is like the number of places that are um, mowed down, clear cut. So side of roads, power line segments, that kind of thing, places that are being developed. I know, David, you mentioned that you went in and got some jack of the pulpit. I totally would have done the same thing. Um, uh, but, no, that was a pitcher plant. Oh, sorry, pitcher plant. For an uh, education purpose. <laughs> yes. But um, I wonder if there's, you know, I've, I've talked about and thought of this idea of having like plant salvage, right? Like, is there an opportunity to somehow work with land developers or land managers who are, you know, cutting back these, um, these shrubs and that kind of thing to go tried, in and harvest some of that, you know, beforehand. I tried that in the early years. I sent out letters to contractors and they just thought I was just off the wall. But uh, I was, my intent was gleaning out some species and having a little native display garden set up in the new building or the new industry, show them what they save. And they make, it's an educational thing to have a little native display garden. Again, I only deal with the understory plants. I'm not selling oaks and trees, which are, which are needed. But the, the, just a little display bed to show the contractor what you allowed us to do. So a little volunteer day wouldn't be too much. Um, but some, some, some developers, they're, they're, they're very sketchy on that. They're, quite unaware of what you're trying to do. They think that you're going to find a rare orchid and shut them down. I've come across that before too, but no, I'm just here just to, to, just to showcase something that could be saved. I would caution, just, just to put my two cents in on the permanent, I would caution going on public ground, even crown, uh, and just harvesting willy-nilly. I do believe no. that on some areas of crown, you do require a permit for that kind of stuff. You do. Uh, in particular, if it's crown uh, harvestable, in other words, if it's Irving land on crown, you can't go there and harvest anything without first getting permission or a permit. It doesn't cost you a lot. It's, same as, uh, it's the same permit, I think, that they use for uh, harvest of um, down timber. So some guys go and take firewood for uh, off of crown land that's just been left. So they salvage firewood that way. I think it's the same permit required there to go and harvest seedlings and stuff like that. Because I've, I've looked into that before, like, you know, we go and buy a ton of spruce or birch and stuff like that. Well, sometimes it's just as easy to send my staff out and dig a bunch out of a ditch or out of a out of an old clear cut and, and go that route. The other area where you need a permit is access off highways. You can't go into a highway or a numbered highway uh, owned by DTI without first having a permit or access permit. That's if you're going to follow the letter of the law. I know that there are a ton of people that go out and harvest dogwood for instance for christmas decorations and christmas trees yeah. uh, and they do it probably without permits but technically by law you're supposed to re uh, request permission for that yeah yeah th those lycopodiums they use those in wreaths yeah uh, lycopodium takes ages in which to grow yes i believe ban full heartedly that we have yeah. got to be open and honest in this it's called theft yeah. it's theft so one of the things that I, I know the original one of the original questions was how do we increase the um, the amount of native plants being available in the province. And one of the ideas that we had also chatted about was, you know, Ben, you know, the watersheds, they're, they're, they're bringing, they're looking for large numbers of certain species, right? So I think to start somewhere, it would be really great if we could get, you know, a list of 10 species that we already know would be in high demand if somebody were to, you know, start harvesting them, right? And 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 we just start with that. We start taking that information around to to the larger greenhouses. And I mean, the work that you know the folks on the call who have these smaller nurseries are doing is invaluable and and amazing. But to to get those higher numbers that we need, um, you know, taking that information around to retailers across the region and saying, hey, like if you if you have these, people are have already said they would buy them. Right. And so make that ec economic case to them. And there, there is a challenge with there is a challenge a little bit with that curse. A, the geographic differences between each of the watershed groups. Uh, B, uh, the 
uh, fluctuation within our funding as well. Um, so our funding is up and down. One year we might have a bunch of trees and uh, that we've told the nursery, yeah, we want trees. The next year we might not have any money to put trees in the ground or plant or pay staff to plant them, right? So yeah. there is that variability and there is an on there is a, a real challenge. Uh, you know, I don't want to tell my nursery, yeah, I'm going to have a bunch of money to plant trees if I don't already have a contribution agreement signed. And those oh, yeah. agreements are yeah. only three to five years. Well, in three to, it takes three to five years to grow that many trees. So that right. that is the challenge. So, but still though, if we're asking for native stock, then I'm hoping that the nurseries are growing native stock. We had, I think five nurseries that we, that we worked with in the last two or three years trying to get trees. Thanks, I see Nathalie has her hand raised. I see Jean as well and uh, Samuel. So we'll we'll okay. move on, but great, that's awesome. That okay. those specificity is the time of stuff yeah, that we'll help keep forward. Nathalie? Oh, I am. They're still unmuted, I believe, Nathalie. No, okay, now I heard you there. Can you hear me? We can, yeah, now we can. Now I hear you. <laughs> Good. I, I just, I'll be quick. I just wanted to mention, Kristen, that there is some information out there about the, uh, the species you can plant, your waterways, even here in New Brunswick. Um, I'm working on a toolkit that will be on the NPN website in a couple months. But if you're looking for something right now, I know the Fundy Biosphere Reserve has a great toolkit they released uh, a couple of years ago. So if you look on their website, it's out there, and if I have time, I might post. I might find it and post it on the chat. Thank you. Okay. Gene, nice to have you with us. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Wonderful presentations with seeing people I haven't seen for a while. We are in Colton County out here in Zone Three, so. Lots of things that are down by the river or south of Woodstock, uh, we'd have a hard time with. But when I first started Fallsbrook Center, we went out uh, to the and gathered acorns around the cathedral and around the cemetery in Fredericton. Nobody said no. And we brought them back and just plunged them in with a, with a whatever that thing is that you that you uh, hold cement with a big pole like that, just everybody just going through the forest and plunging them in. And now 20, 30 years later, oaks are not uh, in zone three, but we have lots and lots of oaks which have their own acorns. So, the, so that's one thing. I mean, you can go and gather acorns, they're pretty simple. We had a hard time looking for, black ash, which we're working with native communities, so they want black ash. Uh, I used to work in, in Guantanamo in Cuba and doing restoration with them, and they had no way to find seeds because there were very few trees left because of the move to sugarcane. And we made a map of the whole of the town of Guantanamo. This is a town of Guantanamo, not the base, of where the trees were when they flowered, when they seeded, so that the guys could go around on their bicycles and collect seeds. So we're hoping to do out here for our zone, you know, so that we don't have to suddenly get in a mad frenzy in the fall. Where are the seeds? Are they here? Are, you know, where the trees are that are never taking seeds from the, all the seeds from the same tree, obviously, looking, you know, we, we could go into that as another subject. But I think if people start looking, the looking for, where they can send their volunteers out. You know, there's lots of harvesting along the edge rows. And it was interesting to see Ben's presentation because I've just been getting into this matting thing, putting mats down and we're talking about weaving them and, and for riparian uh, damaged areas. And then I see that you're doing that, just putting stakes in that are you know, brand new, as, as it were, fresh. There we are, fresh willows. So it's like, oh, that would be a lot easier. So lots of things to learn. And Gary, whoa, Tegan's always talking about coming over and visiting you and your nursery. One day we'll have to go. And Dave, we're going to see you in another couple of weeks. So we are a little network, and I hope that the MBN can do this sort of thing again. And I think I've said, you know, I've tried with Scott's nursery to get them to bring in things that we want. 
I mean, we do have to pay for them then, but at least, I mean, in on the witch hazel thing, I was just astounded that there's one moth that pollinates the witch hazel. And as we know, the witch hazel flowers, it's like the last flower in the fall. And um, I've got like three witch hazels here, but one poor little moth comes from somewhere to do the pollination for just mine. So this year I've got, we're gonna get to lots of other people in the neighborhood so that when this one little moth comes in, it can, it can have more work to do. <laughs> Thank you for putting it on. It was really super on lots of levels. Thank you so much for joining us, Jean. Uh, David or Gary or Ben or Claire, did you want to respond before we go to Samuel? Great contribution. Yeah. No, I'm good. Okay, Samuel, you've been. I have to say, I have to say, I don't have a much formal training in this, but um, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm a native plant enthusiast in uh, in New Brunswick, and. Uh, my, I guess my training was from McPhail Woods and uh, the, I went uh, through the native plant course there and it was really great. And also the, um, the whole uh, native plant trust, you know, the Go Botany, the, the big uh, New England organization that does it, did like a two day uh, seed increase uh, webinar. So I, I commend everyone to watch it. I'm gonna put it in the, in the chat there again. And it's like basically a, a big webinar that talks about seed increase. So it's all about like how seeds are supposed to be increased and not only like gathered from the wild and sold directly to people. So I think we could really benefit from that approach and like uh, putting them in increased plots to make them grow a bit like David and Gary are doing in McPhail Woods and, uh, and uh, save a native plant just to see how um, the whole, uh, you know, the, the seeds can increase and become uh, bigger plants and become sources for more plants in the future mm -hmm. that we can then distribute the seeds and the plants to people in the future. So I think that's a good, it's a good resource to, uh, to, to look at. Great. So not just seeds to plant out, but actually thinking about the seeds as a, as a source of stock for future planting. Yeah, it's infinite that's seeds. You know, like you plant seeds to get more seeds. And I think that's a sustainable approach to it because you don't want to you don't really want to give generally, I think, plants that were gathered from the wild to people, because then that's going to lead to more poaching in the future, right? Great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a nice example. Of yep. Then now you put in. a now you put a price on them. You put a price on a plant. That's pretty dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. So we had introduced. Thanks for that, Samuel. We had um, introduced this idea of the one. One thing, one takeaway, um, still an opportunity to share on that. Uh, another sort of question or area of discussion was thinking a little bit in terms of next steps, I guess, um, for this as individuals, as groups, for, for, for this group here, for those on the call, on, on the, the meeting today, just in terms of get, engaging the interest in, in creating a network around the work that we're already doing, the work that we'd like to do, um, there's been talk of community nursery. There was talk of a cooperative in some of the in some of the survey results. Um, we'll maybe just have a little bit of a conversation around. I know you, Gary, when you, I first met you and you came to Kokaini, you helped us this idea of a community nursery at the school, and it's it's, it's still going. Um, that's, yeah, maybe just some thoughts around what are the next steps for us. Um. I've always felt that we're trying to get people to fall in love with plants. And if you don't fall in love with the plants, I, I really can't touch you then. So that's why we do so many workshops and talks and walks and our website and stuff like that. And people, you know, the, the thing that I hear most is that they love passion, right? I think when people are teaching and they don't have passion, it's kind of boring, you know? I remember literally the forestry guys in the province saying, you know, with their arms crossed over their chest saying, you know, we tried giving workshops and no one comes. And I just blurted out, well, no shit. Who's going to come if somebody's standing there with their arms crossed and pissed off? And yet we get lots of people out. We've been doing it for a long time. But it's that getting people to love plants, because there's a ton of people who love plants now that didn't beforehand. They just, and not because they're bad people, they just didn't know those plants. So again, I'm looking at David's photos and stuff and I'm saying, yeah, there's just lots of plants that I love, right? There's, there's some beautiful thing. Uh, and I think that's what touches people and they will engage their kids as well, right? Because that's what we've seen. It's like planting that seed and, and seeing seedlings grow is 
talking to adults and seeing them talk to the kids or talking to the kids, seeing them talk to the adults, right? So I think it's that kind of thing. And I don't think we should be afraid to talk about being in love with plants or loving forests or whatever. You know, people say, well, you're just a tree hugger. And I say, that's the worst thing you can say about me. I'm totally happy with that. Um, but we really do need to engage people on that level where it's something sort of visceral. And they're saying, you know, we really, we really think these are important. And then we think it's important enough to protect habitat. I love the, um, this, the description of the story Jean told in terms of relationships between the different speed the plants and then the insects and the animals that depend yeah. on it. The monarch is a perfect example of that. So the stories behind and the connections beyond that plant is really key too. So more, more thoughts? Yeah, it's gonna to have to start Anything? with the youth. I think we get to start with the youth, like school programs. Um, again, more native display beds. And the day that I worked with them, the indigenous folks with the medicine wheel, it was a real exciting day. We had an elder there and she just blessed the area and talked and we learned off of each other. And we, it's, it's the respect of each other. We got to get through this together. And I think with, with our youth now coming in, I, I think because COVID has really, COVID has brought us out from the, from the depths of a, of a darkened room and we're just finding something a little different. And as Gary said, if we can just get people to love each other through the plants, I, I, think, I, think, we've, I think we've got a pretty good, we get a pretty good stab at this, but for me, it's it's the youth, and I enjoy giving little tours through the garden. And back to the acetea, the red baneberry. I yes, I make note that that is a poisonous plant. So you, so there, you just have to steer children away from them. Don't take the love away from a youth who wants to look and 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 to pick at a plant. Love them up for what they are. That's all we got. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll just say, uh, I don't disagree, Dave, the kids are got to be where it's at, but we can't just isolate everybody just for the sake of the kids. Um, we deal with a large array of landowners from farmers to industry to whatever, and it, it has to be with a respectful dialogue, uh, trying to create, I always say uh, my job is to create win-win-win scenarios, so uh, win, for my, win for our organization, win for the landowner or the partner that we're working with, and a win for the ecosystem that we're looking to improve. So, uh, and it is, it's, I love, you know, the passion is important. Uh, you've got it. When I engage a landowner, I want them to be passionate about making a positive change to their local ecosystem. Uh, and when I engage my nurseries, I want them to have a passion to, to help us, you know, make a change too. And I think that's important. Um, and don't be scared to compromise a little bit. You know, at, at times we're not always going to be able to do necessarily what we want. And again, I'm talking from a watershed or a restoration type of approach, not necessarily in your own garden. In your own garden, you can do what you want and grow what you want to grow. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, don't be scared to compromise if you're working as a watershed group to move forward. Um, give a little to get a little type of thing on, on our waterways. Um, ideally, uh, I, if I could talk to a farmer and get a 15 meter setback across all my waterways, I'd be happier than a pig in, pig in a blanket, right? But um, sometimes I have to, you know, the, so maybe sometimes a farmer has got a really good piece of property that we want to just start making progress on. So it's a compromise. At first, I take a five meter setback from them and start to restore that five meters. And then once I put a really good project on the ground and show them how good it uh, works, maybe then he'll come back to me and say, listen, Ben, can we, can we do more of this down further or somewhere else on my property? And listen, I'll give you 20 meters. And now I'm up, now I'm up, up meters type of thing, if you want to look at it that way. So but yeah, and ongoing conversations, uh, time. Um, we're not going to get, we're not going to do this while we're young. It's going to take time and then we're, we're all going to be old at the end of the day. Thank you, Ben. Claire, did you want to share something? Yeah, I think a couple takeaways and sure. um, just from a lot of the conversations today too, is I think really sharing with people of, you know, taking the perspective that our gardens are an extension of our natural areas. So what you plant in your garden, you know, impacts so much more beyond than, you know, just that little plot that you may have on your property. It's really all an interconnected system that we have to keep a lot of different things in mind. And I think um, earlier, Serge, when you were asking about what we can do, certainly to increase 
um, native plants in the province is I think, you know, continue to ask um, your local nurseries, um, whether that's, you know, the smaller nurseries, but even the larger nurseries for those native plants, because then those will help, you know, those shifts happen where we have more plants, you know, native plants available, even if some nurseries only have a few, that's still better than not having any at all. Um, but yeah, as Ben has said too, it's, it's not going to be an overnight um, change. It's going to take a while to make those changes happen, but any movement forward is still moving um, the effort forward. Great. That's part of that broadening the conversation. And just before we go to Donnie, thanks, Neil, for your comment about the wild things that we share our spaces with. It's not yard, it's all habitat. That's a great way that the mindset of looking at it as a natural area. I've worked in schools quite a bit and we started calling areas in the school there the Espace Nature, a natural space. And um, you know, we planted a few trees at the beginning and you can see the shrubs coming in and the insects following. So their biodiversity is always now. That's great. Donnie, go ahead. Hi, Serge. Uh, first, I just want to apologize. I, I didn't get the update at Lake, so I just sort of got in the last half hour. I didn't realize. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Platform. But um, I just wanted to say hi, introduce myself, and you know, I'm very interested in in this group and what's going on. So I'm the coordinator for the National Tree and Shrub Center of Canada, and we're located in Fredericton. And our mandate is conservation of Canada's forest genetic resources. So the 700 tree and shrub species that can be conserved, our mandate is to have the genetic diversity of those species from all across Canada in our conservation collections here. Um, Whenever I, I, you know, I hear conversations like this native plants, um, and we're going through this with 2 billion tree program, because all they want to talk about is the appropriate species, but not appropriate seed sources. And I, I always want to push that, that, yeah, native, talking at a species level is not good enough. You really, we really have to start moving to local seed sources or seed sources that are appropriate based on science and based on potential climate change and, and what's happening. Um, so I just, I know it makes things more complicated. <laughs> you can't always get local seed sources, but again, that's something that we specialize in. So we specialize in the collection, uh, cleaning, testing, and long-term storage of our forest ecosystem species. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything we can do to help this group, um, you know, whether that be training. So uh, by the end of this summer, we will actually have a certified seed collection course uh, that people can take. So we're working with the province of Ontario. They're the only ones that currently have that. So basically people, we're gonna be administrating that course for them throughout the rest of Canada, outside of Ontario. So um, yeah, so basically it, it teaches a lot of the questions that people are asking here about you know where you can collect and regulations, that's all covered in the course. So it, it, it gives people the confidence that they know what they're doing and then when they're making those collections that the seed is actually ripe and ready for harvest and then what do you need to do to that seed to preserve it not only for next year's purposes but you know for your next 20 years so you don't have to always constantly going out and collecting you collect it when it's good bumper crop anyway i can ramble on forever i just wanted to say hi and, and i'll leave it at that Thanks. well and i'm glad you did and i'm intrigued to know more about how you operate um i soon noticed someone wanted to get to get to the name of your organization and your, and your contact information. If you could dump that into the, the, the chat, that would be great. Um, and just opportunities for, for training and just certainly for collaboration. I'm keen to know if you go out into the field or if you need people to do that for you and how we can develop something around that. Um, sounds like some interesting collaboration there, potentially. Thank you for joining us, that's great. Any final, you could just take a minute to breathe and take it all in. Final comments, suggestions. At this point, I would usually get folks to come up and pretend to be a bird or something in my environmental education role. We can all do that in our own time, I think. Gary, I see you still have your microphone open. Any last words of inspiration. No, I'm just impressed there's this many people interested and I want to thank you again for inviting me and hopefully I added something to it but uh, these are really fun to do for me because I don't have to drive anywhere right. 
<laughs> and knowing that you were potentially in Moncton and you weren't even in Moncton, it all Moncton worked out okay. Today on it, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for leading it off. I think you really put us on the right stage for this conversation, for the thoughtfulness. Um, David, also for your wisdom and sharing all those, that knowledge of those plants, and we hope to know more from you. Ben, sorry we didn't have more time. We'll have to come in for a visit and see that work firsthand. Claire, keep the up plants are the work. greatest teacher. The plants are the greatest teacher, the not me. Teacher. <laughs> I'm still learning. Wonderful. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, guys. Truly yeah, appreciate it. Cool I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step off. Yes, oh, thanks thank for joining you. us. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, folks, Until everyone, next time. for joining us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And uh, we'll send a, a follow up to everyone who's here. See how we continue this conversation, turn it into action. And yes. continue the action for those who are already doing it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.